he says, but if you alter one ingredient, it'll kill you. That's true of bolognese, if yeah. you like switch <laughs> like, the ground beef for uranium. <laughs> for iron shavings, yeah, no, that'll do it every time. That'll do it every time. Do you think, because they make it seem like it gives you AIDS, and I bet there are cut lines from the script where Michael Flatley was like, oh, it's like the AIDS, is it? And they were like, you can't have you say that on camera, Michael Flatley. <laughs> Please stop saying AIDS. <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema, unless something comes along that is so bad it redefines the very nature of awful. In which case, we watch that instead. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath's going to be unable to join us tonight. He's in Portugal, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Well, I'll be telling you, No Illusions is a fine day. All right, it is a fine day. I thought I would just let everyone know the level of cultural sensitivity I'm going to have yeah, okay, towards no, our good. Irish brethren <laughs> right yeah, here yeah, at the well, outset. That's why we couldn't have Heath on the show, to be perfectly honest with you. He would he would have come to the yeah, defense of no, his Heath people. Heath side-tackled me into four recordings, and we yeah. just eventually decided <laughs> to do it while he was on vacation. <laughs> and of course, also joining us tonight is the host of Be Reasonable, the co-host of Skeptics with a K, and the editor of Skeptic Magazine, Michael Martin. Marshall Marsh. Welcome back, sir. Uh, you guys can't hear it, but I'm very slowly raising my head and peeping at you from beneath the brim of my hat. That's how excited I am at Ooh. this film. Oh. a very slow hat revealer. What angle is that hat at, Marsh? <laughs> oh, it's exactly 50% of the way between jaunty and rakish. It's hit the sweet <laughs> spot between the two. 90 <laughs> degrees to his head somehow. <laughs> it's balanced on the brim of his yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tell us, Marsh. What will we be breaking down today? Oh, so we watched Michael Flatley's film, Blackbird. And it is the story of an aging Irishman who used to be the best at what he does, who then moved to the Caribbean and surrounds himself with flunkies and yes men. But then he gets called out of his comfortable retirement to make a movie about a spy or something, I think. <laughs> yep, it is that. It's the story of him going like, you know, my life is actually quite a bit like Casablanca, if you think about it. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you loved the climactic dance fight that closed out Riverdance, but you missed your local senior citizen production of it, you will love this movie. And oh my God, do I love <laughs> so this movie. Look, <laughs> I used to be able to watch these movies like two times, sometimes even three times. I would pre-watch, and then I'd get to watch twice on the week. I haven't watched a movie twice in months, maybe even years. I watched this movie twice in a row. Like, I watched it, <laughs> took my notes, and then just w -w 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 watched it again. Well, and, and we should point out here that we've been listening to Marsh talk this movie up since like 2019. It's been a long fucking time coming. Mm -hmm. This movie is legend. So Marsh, Marsh gave us so much more heads up about this movie than he did his marriage. Yep. Right? Yep. Like we were aware that Marsh had been married with no way. He was like, oh yeah, no, I had a wedding. There was a wedding in my life. Michael, <laughs> we've gotten the play by play yes. of this production. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so tell us, Marsh, how did, how did this movie happen? So the thing we have to kind of understand to begin with is that Michael Flatley is like a weapons grade egotist, like one you of the most narcissistic say. men yep. who's ever lived. And <laughs> like he's he's not a good dude. But a lot of people know him from just the dancing, like, oh, he can move his feet fast and not move his arms that much. And that's kind of about <laughs> the much that they know about Michael Flatley. But like he performed at Trump's inauguration and described it as one of the greatest honors in his life. Oh. He's he's cozied up to far right like fascists on uh, on Irish Twitter, like uh, General Doherty talking about when she was saying we need to stop the Muslims coming here because they make an island a third world country he responded to say keep up the fight Gemma so like, this is the kind of person he is right and in March 2018 he announced his directorial debut the film Blackbird and ever since that point for like years it was shrouded in mystery there were like film critics in, in Ireland going on investigative deep dives that have taken them six months to try and understand what the hell is happening with this film. Is it made if it's if it's not made? It was apparently finished in 2018. There was a screening for just the cast and crew in 2018. But then there was silence for four years and it never came out. 
there was speculation at one point that I think is probably pretty accurate, that what they showed at that point was just a handful of scenes that they'd actually filmed. And they filmed those scenes as like a sort of spec script type thing to right. then ship around production companies to film out, to like to bulk out the rest of the film with like money and, and shots and stuff like that. But nobody wanted it. So Michael flatly had to finance it himself. And so eventually, nobody ever thought this would came out. Eventually we got wind. There was a trailer and it came out. It was in the cinemas, in select cinemas in the UK. It made £50,000 in its opening weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Cinema tickets in the UK are oh about a tenner. God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's like know the names of everyone who saw your movie's right, level yes, exactly. of profitable. Yeah, absolutely. In, in total, it made £120,000, which means fewer than 150,000 people <laughs> saw this film in the cinema. I and four of my friends were five of those 150,000 people when we saw it at an otherwise empty screening in Liverpool. We talked to the cinema staff at the time. We were the only ones who'd sat through the entire film and not walked out of the otherwise largely empty run. It is a legend of a film, and I'm so, so excited to be able to share it with you. It's like uh, Jerry Lewis had released The Day the Clown Cried, right? It's, yeah. There's nothing... <laughs> It's beautiful. And it's on Prime. If you're in the UK or Europe, it's just on Prime for free. Yeah, it was. It's, they've taken it away now because clearly even oh. that wasn't an, attracting enough people in. <laughs> you can still find it if you look hard enough. Yep, yeah. we found it. <laughs> so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Absolutely. Got to go straight in with best worst vanity project slash best best tax write-off. Really? Right? Because this film was written by Michael Flatley, directed by Michael Flatley, financed by Michael Flatley, mm -hmm. executive produced by Michael Flatley, mm -hmm. starred Michael Flatley, mm -hmm. and the film was shot in several of his properties. Okay, so this is a huge vanity project. But the thing you've got to bear in mind is the Irish tax credit scheme for films pays 32% of all of the costs on your cast crew, goods, services, and locations. Wow. And, you know, there's a, a similar scheme in Barbados. So the Irish government picked up one third of the cost of what <laughs> no. Michael Flatley, the financier, thought Michael Flatley, the writer, director, producer, and starer, should be paid for this. He just wrote <laughs> wow. himself a check and had the Irish government uh, sign it, essentially. That's fucking incredible. Yeah, I'm not smart enough to do the math of 32 times 100, but it was that. Whatever that is, <laughs> is what the percentage was. <laughs> So I, I was going to go with best worst wardrobing. Okay. <laughs> Nobody in this movie at any point will wear so much as a single cloth, but that it is ridiculous. We talked about like, his hats. You got his hats. You've got his suits. You've got Eric Roberts suits. You've got this. Every woman in the movie is costumed by like some fucking horny 12 year old boy. Adam and Eve dot com. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> And I, of course, am going to go with best worst action packed conclusion. <laughs> we'll talk uh, about it when it comes. I, there's no words. There's I was no in the cinema words. watching that conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Having spent the entire time watching the film, I've got to. Yeah. When we get there, you've got to picture five of us. And I'll say it right now dressed as characters from the film because we were so excited by this that we did go dress in costume for the film watching that uh, denouement. It's amazing. Oh, I don't believe you're physically capable of putting a hat at that angle, Marsh. I'll say it right now. <laughs> and I, I, I also, I want to throw in another sort of a, a bonus best worst because I want to go with best worst award as well, right? Because for his performance in this film, Michael Flatley won the best actor award at the Monaco Film Festival. No! And I, I know what you're thinking. That's a really prestigious film festival, isn't it? And no, you're thinking of the Cannes Film Festival just down the road from Monaco. Oh. Nobody has heard of the Monaco Film <laughs> Festival. <laughs> he, he won the award in its inaugural year, in July 2021, a mm. year before this film was released and shown to anyone. <laughs> 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 On the strength of a screening that, was all, that only included the cast and crew by invitation. So oh, only the people involved Christ. in the making got to see it. Um, <laughs> which is amazing. And all that seems really weird, except... The Monaco Film Festival is set up and run by a company that is registered in Cork, in Ireland, half an hour's drive from Michael Flatley's home. <laughs> <laughs> and when Michael Flatley's not at his residence in, in Cork, half an hour away from the headquarters of this film festival, he lives in Monaco for tax purposes, oh, where his film festival is. So I think I know why he won this award. 
Fuck Game Pass. <laughs> All right. Well, we've waited half a damn decade to see this thing, so I feel like you guys can wait a few minutes more to hear about it, so we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back in a minute with all the legendary terriblosity. Sorry, I can't use existing words. We do not have words for stuff this bad yet. That is Blackbird. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. So from the bottom of the tube doesn't matter? I mean, I guess it might be more convenient. This is mind-blowing to me. Hey, you guys ready to record more show? Sure. All right, here you go. And one for you. What are these? These are the things I would be saying and doing without therapy. I think it's important to remind everyone sometimes like just how far I've come, you know? Okay, mine just says crying. Yeah, and mine says showing up 45 minutes late, treating everyone like garbage, and then trying to start a big dramatic fight with someone about not liking you. Yeah, yeah. Guess I was going to have a better day that day, so... But but you're saying you don't do these things thanks to therapy? I sure don't. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So if I need a therapist who's secular, queer-affirming, or will help me stop, let's see, loudly announcing which video game characters I find attractive... Um, BetterHelp can help me do that. They sure can. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash awful today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash awful. Okay, but you still do that last thing with the video game character. I said progress, Noah. Progress. All right, lads. Hi, Michael Flatley. I've gathered you all here because I've got it in mind to make myself a spy movie. A spy movie, Michael? What's it about? Well, I'm glad you've asked, Seamus. I'm thinking a classic story of intrigue, espionage, and betrayal from the world's greatest action hero. Well, now, and who would that be, Michael? Wow, really, Marsh? Dude. What? It's... I'm, I'm doing the sketch. Not with that accent, you're not. So insensitive. What? You guys were way worse than I was. We are Americans, Marsh. Our Gaelic brethren expect us to sound like the Lucky Charms mascot when we do accents. But you're English, okay? Not cool. Yeah, dude, that that would be like a German guy doing a Jewish voice. Jewish voice, exactly. Thank you, Noah. I am so sorry, Irish listeners. We were just trying to have fun with some Michael Flatley and this colonialist bigot came at you from nowhere. From nowhere. You wrote in the script, in an Irish accent. It's right there in the script. I don't remember that. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have an iPhone note apology to write and tweet before this gets out of hand. Yeah, me too. Why do I keep agreeing to come on this show? (laughs) (laughs) And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to start off with a few drone shots of Michael Flatley's lovely three-story mansion in Ireland. It's quite nice. Okay, look. Here's the thing. We've dealt with a lot of bad people, and I know that Michael Flatley's a bad person now, as Michael Marshall introduced at the intro, but, like, he got that money from the, from the t- Tippity Taps? This is Tippity mm. Taps it's money? Oh, it's insane. He is this incredibly is a- wealthy. Like, Lord of the Dance makes so much money. This is Tip Tap Mansion? Mm-hmm. Like, I guess I thought they did fine, but of I feel like I all the reasons would... you should have learned to tap dance. I realize. was going to say, I really <laughs> would have taken tap dancing a lot more seriously if I had gotten a shot of this oh. mansion early in life. So, how much money Michael Flatley has at any given time is kind of a, a, a shifting target. It's a bit of an unknown because at the time, or around about the time this film was being filmed, he was actually trying to sell that mansion and all of the possessions in it. And I know that because my friend who's obsessed with Michael Flatley because he hates him so much, has alerts set up for any time Michael Flatley appears in the press. And when Flatley was auctioning off the contents of his house, he contemplated bidding on Michael Flatley's suitcases. <laughs> and to be clear, these aren't like special monogram suitcases. These are just regular suitcases that he was selling to make a bit of money. He was also selling the TV from his spare bedroom, which is like not even a flat screen. It was like an old school, like <laughs> just a big TV. fucking Oh, I could use that for my, for my yeah. video games. That's, old Nintendos, nice. yeah. His partner almost bought him the bust of Napoleon that Michael Flatley was selling. <laughs> but in the end, he couldn't part with the mansion because it, it just meant too much for him. And also it didn't re- meet the uh, reserve price that he was uh, selling. Yeah, right, right. Nobody wanted it for the price. of the- Yeah, no, okay. That, well, that makes sense as to why it is that when we go inside this mansion for like the reception, after the funeral, 
everybody's barkers beautying their way through showing in the lovely dishwasher and shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but they're having, they're having this funeral out in his front fucking yard, just in the middle of the fucking yard. <laughs> It's so weird. There's just a tree in the middle of his garden and they're burying like three people there in, in the middle of a very, very large lawn. It's like, do you really want to put the headstones like right there? Right in the middle. Right in the very center of your beautiful lawn. Yeah. So fucking weird. And, and of course it's rainy, but it's rainy bad. It's bad rain. <laughs> I can't promise you much in this life. We live in an uncertain universe, but there was a, we could just use my sprinklers conversation and that is how the rain for these scenes was generated. Oh, 100%. The rain comes at him from different directions yes. at the same time, which rain can't do. And all I can assume is they just thought, well, it's Ireland. If we film for long enough, it's going to rain. This is Ireland. It is definitely going to get wet at some point and they just must have had a bad spell because, yeah, this, this rain comes at him from all sides. And it's sunny. It's so sunny. <laughs> like, I know it can sometimes rain a bit when it's sunny, but it can't rain that fucking much. But so, but he's at this rainy funeral. His hat is at a jaunty angle. It is impossible to describe that hat without using the word jaunty, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, wait, we're not just going to blow by the, <laughs> the first 45 hat angle, Noah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's what I need our listeners who are young to understand who missed Riverdance. First of all, if you grew up in Shitsville, America, which is where I grew up and Heath grew up and Noah grew up, once a year... River dance would come to your town and everyone in your town went. The town was empty because you all went to go see River Dance. And on stage at River Dance, I guess fucking Michael Flatley or a Michael Flatley impersonator would do the tippity tap 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 taps with his hat at a rakish angle. But but that would be like if the guy who played Peter Pan in your local company's production of Peter Pan was always wearing a wire harness while he was doing his <laughs> grocery shopping. Like, it's not a signature bit. It's your costume from your stage show. <laughs> so, yeah, so he stands there in his jauntily angled hat in the rain Everybody leaves, the, but he's got to be the last person standing at the grave because this is his his wife. Or we, we're going to find out later it was his fiance. We're getting flashes of him watching her die and screaming in rage and shit like that, right? And they keep showing us this same... The only time Michael Flatley manages to look his age in the movie is in this flashback because he's supposed to be quaking with rage, but his entire fucking jowl face yes. is shaking along <laughs> with him. Yes. It's like watching an aftershock in one of those like earthquake-proof windmills, right? It's just like... <laughs> 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 So, yeah, we cut inside so that everybody can see the lovely interior of the home that could be yours for the low, low price of. And to bear in mind, the, the decor in here is Trump levels of tacky, which just undermines the fact that this is Michael Flatley's actual house and his actual possessions. It is Trump level of tacky. I, I wrote in my notes somewhere that this was the tackiest room I've ever seen without Donald Trump in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like someone went through like a museum and was like, I want to live here. Yeah. So. <laughs> But yeah, so and and then of course we we cut to all of like I guess he was supposed to be the leader of this formidable team of spies. So we cut to all the other spies standing inside talking about what a great badass spy he was. Hey, uh no, sorry, just real quick. Uh, what was the name of that team of super the, cool the, spies? The, the, the chieftains. The chieftains. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Which I believe is a folk band that like Michael Flatley tried to join but wasn't allowed to or some crazy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Uh, and I love that they're just talking about like all the people that are talking about how great he is at what he does. A, they don't tell us what he does. B, nope. we won't really find out what we he does. We will never nope. fucking know what it is that he's so good at. Yeah. But this is Michael Flatley's idea of how you set a character up. Like, yes. oh yeah, if you want to demonstrate that a character is like really good at something, you have every other person in the film just have an open conversation about how good he is. And then the barman chimes in with like, yeah, but like, what is he going to do? Like, just cuts through it all. Like, literally, though, let's just talk literally. Factually, <laughs> step by step, what is he about to do? I left so hard when the bartender was like, sorry, you guys have just been speaking in vagaries. What is he going to do? <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry, don't participate. Yes. 
<laughs> bartender. Bartender, by the way, will be the bartender later in Barbados. Yes. This movie goes to Barbados. So apparently this this team takes their assassins, butlers, spies, and their bartender with them wherever and they And their go. bartender, yes. Yeah, it's like a video game where you've hired the staff for one building, but when you go to, to right. another building, the staff are there as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So and and the and, and what the bartender might as well be saying is, so what do you think the next scene is, huh? <laughs> and we cut outside, and and M- Michael Flatley, his character's name is Victor. He's walking away from the mansion in the again just soaking, soaking sprinkler rain. There is no way that suit isn't going to shrink. And all I can assume mm-hmm. is he did this so he can show that in future scenes when his suit looks like it fits a bit tight. He's like, yeah, no, that was shrinkage because of the rain. It's not because <laughs> of uh, let myself go since the old tippity tap stuff. No, no, it's, yeah, no, it's not that. All of the outfits here. Okay. The only thing I can say about the shirt and coat and jacket sizes Michael Flatley <laughs> chooses to wear is like someone played a prank on him and they were like, oh, Michael, we're going to actually sponsor all the outfits for this movie. And he was like, oh, that's kind, generous of you. And he was like, yeah, but you can only use clothes from the Gap Kids. And Michael Flatley <laughs> was like, joke's on you. I will wear this toddler leather jacket for the flashback where my fiance dies. Oh, do, you think, do you think the costume department uh, SEO trotted him, like in the Roll Doll story, where they just Ooh, like, slowly yeah, replaced his clothes with like a mm-hmm. size smaller? Until <laughs> yes. It was like, hang on a second. But he didn't notice. He never, right, right, yeah, yeah, he exactly. never picked up on it, yeah. So then, so he walks off, we get our title card, Blackbird. Oh God, I was so excited when, when the title card came up in the cinema after five years of like, right. where the fuck is this film? Oh God, best moment of the of the pandemic. <laughs> and even after just that little tiny funeral scene, you knew how bad it was going to be. So you yeah. knew exactly mm-hmm. what was coming. Yeah. So we cut to 10 years later in London and there's this, like, I, I have no idea what's even happening in this scene, right? Like, there's a couple of bad guys you can tell because of their race in a car talking about bad guy stuff. And then we cut to a guy shredding documents. One at a time? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's only shredding these documents for intrigue. And this genuinely feels like there's some tension going on. And I wrote in the notes, all I'll say here is, don't get too attached to this level of tension. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no. Don't get too comfy here. <laughs> right, and also never wonder what he's shredding or what the fuck any of this is. A guy comes up to the door and you can see him through the window, through the like the translucent window or whatever. He hides, he grabs a letter opener and he steps off to the side, you know? He steps to the wrong side. <laughs> oh, he does, he, he does. does. He's, I wanted so badly for the guy to open the door and be like, were you... Were you hoping to hide behind the door? You know you have to be behind the door for a hide behind the door, right? You're just very clearly You're in my back. sight. Hi. <laughs> so, but the dude throws up, uh, puts a letter through the mail slot. It is terrifying mail. The guy is terrified of the mail when it lands. Yes. Like, yeah. Oh, it's, it's just a letter. It's oh, fine. okay. All right. Well, it's not a problem. <laughs> I hope he's like that whenever the postman comes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> But he has to go to the St. James Church. So we cut to a gam justifying church. And by the way, on the way over here, I noticed that like, I feel like the cinematographer for this movie was actually pretty talented Mm. and generally like found great shots. And I felt so fucking bad for this person that their talent was being wasted on this dumbass (laughs) movie. I just wanted to point that out. The only one person doing their job well was the cinematographer. You did a great job, man. (laughs) And that cinematographer, Michael Flatley. He did it all. He did it all. (laughs) How late into... Because here's the thing, right? And we've all been a part of this in some capacity or another. How late into the process do you think the cinematographer realized oh, there's no movie. Why did I wake up at 4 a.m. for the last three months? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) poor guy. So, okay, so so this character, he goes into the church. He's carrying something. He hands it off to this hot nun, and then he kisses her. Right, because he thought he was going to die, and he just wanted to tick, get off with a nun, off his bucket list. He's like, I've got to run to the the church, kiss a nun, (laughs) tick. But yeah, but he hands her something. The other uh, other nuns rather uh, look on disapprovingly, we see that there are three bad guys following close behind him, right? In perfect unison. They're walking in perfect unison. He's been chased by a boy band. I was watching <laughs> yeah. with Nicola, and Nicola said, oh yeah, Michael Flatley, the choreography skills never leave you. That's the last thing to go. <laughs> never leave you. Yep. It's like riding a bike. I wanted them, they pass by the nun when they're chasing him, and I wanted them to kiss her too, right? Just like, oh, oh yeah, I guess yeah, this yeah, is right. what we have to, okay, good to see you. Does he does he pass her something in the kiss? Is that what that is? I think yes. it's meant to be like he kisses her, but it's quite a big thing because this is like 
going to be like the secret formula, blah, 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 on a on like a mini disc or something. Did mm. he smuggle that across in his mouth? I don't think And so. why? Because <laughs> he could have just walked up and handed it to her. There was no one around. Or like slip it in a pocket or something. Yeah, I think he did just hand it to her, but then he also kissed her because he wanted uh. to knock that off his bucket list, uh, which is good because he's going to be dead by the end of this scene, right? Like, so he, he runs off through the alley and he runs himself into one of the many dead ends that you find on London streets. And that's the one thing I hated about visiting London was all the dead ends. But yep. <laughs> he, he gets to a dead end. The bad guys catch up and they're like, we want the hollow coin. What does that mean? Never. Like, we just, you, you know as much as you will ever know. Makes no sense. And later we will see a mini disc. And I'm like, I think Michael Flatley saw one of those and was like, oh, it's one of those hollow coins. The spice is. <laughs> right, and they were yeah. like, oh, no, it's just a mini. You know what? Yeah, it's a, it's hollow, a hollow coin. coin. Yeah. yeah. So, but they, but they shoot that guy. And then we cut over to hot nun. She, she's walking out of the church. She, she ditches the habit. She wasn't really a nun. And then she hands something off to a car that's passing by. Yeah, and it, it feels like the handoff could have been just straight to the car. Right. Because like, they don't they don't chase the car down. There's no one following the car. So the guy could have just like walked past the car and given it to the car and, and not had the whole hot nun scene and not getting killed in the alley scene. Would have worked out much better for him. Yeah. I probably still would have got killed in the alley, but the guys were the following were on foot. They weren't going to keep up with a car. Yeah. Yeah. One of the guys to roll down the window of the car. Wait, wait, wait. Did you French kiss the guy who gave this? Oh, you did? Okay, good. All right. All right. <laughs> Then I'll take the hollow coin slash C ROM with a hundred hours of AOL on it. Yes. I wanted her to have to kiss him as well. And like that's that's like instead of having like a secret code that spies use, like oh, you know, right, oh, right. What, what's the weather like? Well, it's raining in Japan right now. Uh, nothing like that. It's just like, yeah, full on French kiss. <laughs> yeah, to exactly. a stranger. Yeah. Oh, you know what? He did counterclockwise with his tongue. He's not the real deal. Right? <laughs> oh no. I'd watch that in this impossible movie. <laughs> so then we get to Barbados because when you're self financing in a movie, why the fuck not, right? And also, when coincidentally, Michael Flatley also lives in Barbados, and the Barbados government have a twenty five percent tax credit yes, scheme right. if you film there. Yeah, yeah, right. So, but we're but we're gonna. He owns this bar. He owns this fancy bar, which I suppose is it's supposed to be. Yeah, the bar from fucking Casablanca, right? It's like where all of the criminals come to meet or whatever. Yes, yeah, it's called the Blue Moon. And Nicola, when she was watching it, was livid that the logo was a cross and not a moon. Is that like, why would it be a cross? She, was, she, she would not let this go. This came up several times. No, I'm with Nicola. I have that, that several times in my notes as well. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so we get Michael Flatley walking through the bar. Everybody's gathered around him, telling him all this important stuff. He's sipping coffee from a tiny, ridiculously <laughs> tiny <Comically> little. small. <laughs> why would you give him such. Tiny, I Again, they just throughout. kept giving him smaller and smaller mugs. <laughs> yeah. and he never and noticed. And he just never <laughs> noticed. It. It's like if Robert De Niro's character at the end of Raging Bull got to direct Raging Bull. Right? He was like, and then I walk around my restaurant and everybody loves me. <laughs> That's what happens. I know it that. Is, though. Oh, and there's a jazz singer there. Well, there's a woman lip syncing poorly to jazz songs. She looks at Michael Flatley and wants to fuck him. All the women in this movie will look at Michael Flatley and want to fuck him. Right? Yeah, and every single woman in this film uh, is 20 years younger than any man in this film. And yeah, they all want Michael Flatley. 20 is so generous, yep. Mars. <laughs> if you added so the ages bad. of all the women in this movie together, I don't think you would reach Michael Flatley. Michael Flatley's age. Uh, it is fucking <laughs> banana. Like, it's like, is this your grandpa levels of age difference? You can see women being gentle in their grasp of him. Yes, That's right. how much older... <laughs> than them he is. Uh, and there's, there's a great acting moment as well because th they're trying to make out that this is the place where everybody gathers. They're expecting the Prince of Albania to come. And at one point his staff says, oh, and there's the uh, mafiosa on table 12. And like, one, I think you should be a bit more discreet than just like saying that loudly across a, a crowded bar. Right, But yeah. we get to the top of the stairs and Michael Flatley tries to act but it looks like he's counting the tables individually to get to the mafia. Also, like one, two, three, four. Okay, there's the mafia over there. There they are. I found them. <laughs> found them. Hey, I found the mafiosa, everybody. In case you want. So then we also we cut over to two of his assistants. This is Matiti, and I I, I never caught the female characters, the concierge characters' name, but it's Matiti and the concierge. Okay, I didn't realize this towards the end of the movie because I thought Matiti was just like the guy that works for him in Barbados, but 
Later in the movie, it will be revealed that Mutiti was a spy as well, yes. right? No. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible to me because Michael Flatley was in that spy group and then it retires to own a fucking hotel and bar in Barbados. And Matiti was in the same group and retires to be his manservant. His <laughs> butler. Yes, right. He was like, fellas, I think I've got to take a step back from this spy life. I'm going to relax and own a, you know, Casablanca bar. And Matiti was like, do you need a butler? <laughs> yes. I was thinking right. of buttling right after this. <laughs> Right. I'm the only African American character who's not a villain in the movie. Right, yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And his friend Nick, who is also one of the spies, his he also moved to Barbados with him, but doesn't have to do any work. No, it's no. so <laughs> fucked up. So we're we're gonna dig into that relationship a little bit more. But we get Matiti and the and the female concierge, they get a phone call and it's just it's just somebody saying, Hey, can we come stay at your hotel? And they're like, Yeah, man. Sure can, <laughs> right? But it's an evil bad guy. We're trying. We have to introduce that the notorious Blake Molyneux is coming to stay at this hotel, right? Mm. And so M Matiti comes out to tell Michael Flatley about this, and he's like, "Hey, man, I think this guy might be mixed up with Libyan terrorism. You sure you want him at the hotel?" And Michael Flatley is like, "Yeah, no, that's good. That's fine. I don't care." Yeah, he's got like a, his response is basically, well, that's none of my business. Like, like Michael Flatley's character has a live and let live approach to death formula that will kill everybody <laughs> yes, on the planet, right, apparently. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the jazz singer comes to flirt with him a little bit. The 22 year old jazz singer character comes to flirt with him, which is comfortable. She literally says, Yo, well, Nicola was saying, oh, Michael Flatley here really wants us to think he's handsome. And as she says that, the sexy jazz lady uh, comes over and says, you're looking very handsome, Michael Flatley. <laughs> oh. A reminder, that is a line that Michael Flatley wrote for a girl in his 20s to say about him. He's yes. like, yeah, that's a reasonable thing she would say. Yeah. Yep. And I think the dance fight at the end of every Riverdance show is riveting. And whoever <laughs> said it was silly is wrong. I'm a young person. <laughs> so. YOLO. No, I don't think there's any hypocrisy in living in a tax haven and then making all your uh, public statements being about how much charity you're raising and how great you are as a philanthropist. <laughs> I see nothing wrong with that. Michael Flatley wrote this line for me. Yeah, right, right. So yes, but he closes out the bar. All the beautiful women gather around desperately hoping to fuck him that night. He actually, he walks up to his buddy Nick, the white guy, and he goes, Nick, you are my very good friend. And then he walks over to Matiti, the black guy, and he goes, Matiti, you are my employee. <laughs> yes. Yes, <he> does. <laughs> and Matiti, just to be clear, I really don't like to mix business and friendship. So <laughs> I do need you to clock out if you're going to come whisper secrets into my ear. <laughs> And by the way, we're like 17, 18 minutes into this movie. Nothing has happened, right? Mm -hmm. This movie is so fun to watch that I kept being ridiculously far into the movie being like, they still haven't done anything. <laughs> yeah. Nothing happens. Yeah. Yes. They've got 14 <laughs> seconds left in the movie. <laughs> I'm loving it. Yeah. And especially uh, of all the things that don't happen, Michael Flatley's character is the least involved in anything that does happen. He's the yes. only one. Every, other stuff is happening vaguely around him, but he does nothing for the entire fucking film <laughs> and he's meant to be the star. <laughs> so, okay. So now we've got to introduce our bad guy. So we cut to this overgrown jungle orphanage or something like that that the bad guys are torturing a dude in this scene is remarkable for how little it will matter to the remainder of the film <laughs> it's michael flatley was like we need a really really noisy torture scene right because this actor look no small parts he's really <clears throat> going for it right he's decided his post torture scream is like um like someone doing a mean impersonation of the Joker at the Joker is what I, like a hater, 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 hater. So like all the action movie beats that are playing out, like I'm a bad guy and you've disappointed me, which is all this scene is for establishing, are kind of overshadowed by the fact that he's like, I will tell you. <laughs> oh, and it's just the most lorem ipsum of villain monologues. It yeah. really is. <laughs> I think he's enjoying him so enjoying himself so much as he tortures this ambassador. And you know, it's like they say, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your yeah. life. And then he's just really embodying that. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. They go. do say that. This is Farouk, by the way. He will appear in one scene later in the movie and not do anything in that scene. We've seen Christian movie actors just very clearly contribute cameos to movies, and Farouk appears less than yep. <laughs> some of those cameos we've yeah. seen. <laughs> 
So, okay. So we get, it's the next day. Flatley is starting another day of work at the bar. He's wearing a different hat because he's yes. got to cycle through him. Yeah. He, exactly. Literally at this point in the movie, at one point, he's wearing a hat. And as he's doing a walk and talk, an unnamed extra comes and presents him with a different hat. <laughs> yes. The, she swaps out hats for him. It's so fucking weird. He's got a hat guy. Like her job is just to be the hat exchanger. It's yes. <laughs> She's in the middle of talking to someone. Oh, shit. 155. Sorry. He's doing another hat. Yes. <laughs> World famous spy Blackbird is due another hat. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, okay, so, but Mr. Now it's time for Mr. Blake Molyneux, the bad guy, to show up and check into the hotel. And damn it, if it is not Eric the fuck Roberts. Hell oh, yes. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Now, here's a fun game because I know a lot of people will like watch along and then pause and listen to us talk about it. So, fun game to play if you're watching along or if you haven't watched this movie yet and you're deciding to. This movie is called Watch Eric Roberts Get Blackout Drunk <laughs> in the Course of the Film. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. This absolutely. first scene is the soberest he will be, and he's already pretty fucking drunk. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like they don't normally shoot movies in chronological order. With Eric Roberts, you have to, and you have to write up the script that by the end he's drunk because it's just right. not going to happen any other way. <laughs> so he's checking in also with a girl that's 35 years younger than him. This is Hottie McHotton Todd. You might recognize her from Captain America, the first Avenger. Uh, she, was, she was USO dancer number six of 20. There were 20 of them mm -hmm. listening to the crash. She was among the 20. So Everywhere you look for this movie, when it describes the cast, it credits her with the Captain America role like it was a major yes. role. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best that they can do. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. But yeah, but she recognizes Victor's buddy Nick as they're, as they're checking in, right? And then Eric is like, hey, wait, do you two know each other? And he's like, why? No, we do not. It's so funny how bad the performance is, right? Because we've all seen this part of a spy movie where it's like the person recognizes the other person and there's sort of a knowing look. But this actor who plays Nick is just staring at her <laughs> like her top <laughs> fell open the entire scene. And Eric Roberts is like, hey, man, what are you doing? And he's like, nothing. Yes. Nothing. Right. <laughs> So, yeah, so then we cut to Flatley in a church desperately justifying his gam inclusion here. Christian Fuck movie. Yeah, he yep. does. Double Christian movie. Yeah, well, and the priest even walks up to him here and he's like, hey, man, are you actually going to do my religion this time? Or are you just here to sit around and be mopey? And he's like, yeah, sit around and be mopey. Come on again. Have you noticed how nobody ever has a conversation in church while looking at each other? Yeah. Because the priest does the classic thing. Michael Flatley's there in the pew. The priest walks up behind and stands adjacent to the pew behind him. And they have a conversation like that. And you see in every are you not allowed to look at each other in church? Is that a rule? Yeah, maybe you have, have no to be there? looking at the crucifix the whole time or something. Yeah, it's like when you're going to dinner with your wife and they put you at a booth, but you have to be next to each other. And <laughs> you're just like, ah, oh, this is really fucking awkward. Like, yeah. ah, man, my <laughs> right. neck hurts. <laughs> also, this this priest as well, he's very clearly got like a northern accent. Like he's from Yorkshire or something like that. How? What's your story? How are you a Yorkshire <laughs> priest at Michael Flatley's Barbadian, uh, Barbadian <laughs> right. church? Ooh, right. Right. Yeah. Well, this brings up my favorite thing about the movie. And look, I know this is hypocritical because Americans do this all the time. Like the fucking aliens have, a, you know, Brooklyn accents yeah, in right, every right, Hollywood exactly, yeah. movie. Uh -huh. But there was something so funny to me about every single person in this multinational spy corporation being like, hello, my name is the Dark Queen of the Night now, don't you know? Yeah. And it's, but I just love the fact that he's a Yorkshire priest because I think at this point as well, like he, he tries to get Flatley to confess his sins. Yes. And uh -huh. Flatley's having none of it. And the priest's like, all right, well, you know, if you need me, I'll be down pit. I'll be, I'll be outside down pit. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and also we have to acknowledge the suit that Michael Flatley is wearing because this is his best worst suit of the entire movie. It's this golden yellow, like, like fucking McDonald's arches yellow plaid jacket over a midnight blue shirt and tie. It would be a really adorable outfit to put a small child in. Right? Sure. Like if I put my toddler in this outfit, everyone would be like, oh my God, that picture of him in the little yellow suit is so cute. Oh, and his hat is at that little mm. angle and yeah, everything. exactly. It's like an adorable <laughs> children's photo shoot, but he is 65. He's yeah. 65, oh y'all. 
He's uh, 65. He's older than the age my dad was when he died. <laughs> and he's walking around dressed like a cute fucking picture day for my toddler. Yes. <laughs> and at, at this point, his hat has, has gone beyond jaunty. If his, if his hat gets any more angled, he's going to be having to wear it vertically. This is staying on by like <laughs> friction a lot. He's balancing it on his head at this yeah. point. You yeah. know, you can do that thing where if you like, you rub it, a balloon on your jumper, you can get to like stick to the wall. Right, yeah. Stick. Exactly. That's how they put his hat with yeah. Yeah. He has to rub mm-hmm. the hat on the jumper first. So we go back to the hotel. Uh, Matiti is filling him in. He's like, hey, you know, Eric Roberts, this character checked in. He's like, oh, okay, great. And then Nick, the buddy is like, hey, Michael Flatley, I have something really important to tell you. And Michael Flatley is like, no, you don't. Because like it works better if he sees the blonde without expecting it. Right. Like that's the beat that they're going for. But it's so cartoonishly stupid in its execution that he's like, hey, I have to tell you something. It's important. And then his boss is like, no, it isn't. And he's like, oh, okay, bye. (laughs) Yeah. It's again, the beat is supposed to be I'm too busy. Tell me later. Why didn't you tell me? But he's not too busy. He's just walking around dressed like a little sailor lad from a (laughs) pornographic cartoon. (laughs) Meanwhile, we got Eric Roberts and uh, the blonde, Hottie McCottentot. Her character's name is Vivian. They're settling into their hotel. She comes in in her underwear and she's like, hey, which of these dresses with um, knee length necklines would you would you prefer me to wear tonight? <laughs> right. And Eric Roberts is like, I'm playing Slay the Spire. Go do somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah, he's too busy working. He gives her a bunch of money and he's like, hey, go, you know, go out shop and uh, have yourself a good time. I don't have time for you, right? He hands her this wad of notes and they look actively wet. It's like a papier mache <laughs> wad of notes. I don't know what Eric Roberts <laughs> did to that money. That was what he was paid in. Yep. And they were like, hey, Eric, do you mind if we use your big wad of money, which was exactly what you had in your contract, big wad of money. <laughs> wet, big wet wad of money. For yeah. a prop. Yeah, wad brackets one, yes. He was like, okay, but I already took a shower with it. So just know that it's going to be soaking wet. So she, so she leaves. She's wearing a fucking, the dress, the neckline on her dress literally plunges below her navel. Have you ever seen someone who's in a like very revealing outfit and they're just uncomfortable? Yep. That's every woman in this movie, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, dress however you yes. want. Yeah. And some people love to show off their bodies, but every actress here was shown their outfit for the day by Michael Flatley to the tune of, ah? Huh? Yeah. Huh? And they were like, God damn it. Yeah, he br- brings it out in an egg or whatever. And he's like, hey, wait, I got your. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then Eric Roberts, we're back in his hotel. He gets a call on his 1956 phone. From Ahmed the Libyan terrorist. I did not see a writing credit for Jeff Dunham on this one, guys. So uh, this lawsuit's going to blow up. Get ready, everyone. When they get off the phone, Ahmed says, don't disappoint me. And Eric Roberts, again, we've heard that, you know, cliche line a thousand times in movies. Eric Roberts' response will stay with me for the rest of my days. Eric Roberts says, I don't disappoint anyone ever. <laughs> yes. Eric Roberts mm. says, <laughs> I, I wrote my notes. I'm like, well, Vivian didn't seem too impressed. I'll be honest with you. So. <laughs> it feels like that's like an affirmation his therapist has given him. Yes. Like Eric Roberts' therapist. Like, no, just like, <laughs> you're fine, Eric. Just, just remember, you're, you are worth it. You're worth it. It's okay. What other people think of me is none of my business. <laughs> I'm Eric Roberts. <laughs> so then we cut to Vivian. She's out on the beach in a hilariously revealing bikini. Again, the chosen by a 12-year-old boy's erection. Yeah. This is where we meet Quan. So she's got this security linebacker that follows her around and watches her wherever she goes. And she's not super comfortable with it. And this movie does not do enough to establish that it's not because he's black. Right? There's no, like, it does not. <laughs> yes, no. It absolutely. does not. Mm. It really should. They should have maybe gotten a white guy for this one. Because there's a lot of like, I don't like the way he looks at me. And I'm like, yeah, second out of two black guys, huh? Second right, out of two yes. black guys. Is <laughs> yes. I used to ever say that about? 
<laughs> I mean, look, I know Michael Flatley wrote the script, so there was no way someone was going to come up to Michael Flatley and be like, hey, Michael, I'm worried that's a little racist. And he's like, well, <laughs> you have not heard my Twitter, okay? Yeah, right, yeah, trust right, me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is me toned down. <laughs> well, when, when Michael Flatley meets Quan, he, he describes him as, he's a big unit. And it's like, yeah, because like the N-word is frowned on these days. Right, so it says yeah. that in the script instead. Yeah. Yeah. No, someone changed that in his script and he was like, oh, I swore I wrote the way, you know, I'll just say it the way <laughs> I must I wrote. have wrote unit. Um, yeah, so but this is where Michael Flatley sees Vivian for the first time, and we get this conversation that might as well have been made with cliche movie magnets on his fridge. He goes, and I quote, you're a sight for sore eyes, and she says, and I quote, no one has seen you for years. We feared you were dead. We? Yeah. Jesus Christ. She delivers these lines with all the conviction of an AI-generated YouTube video, like one that nobody <laughs> right. has been involved in the making of at all. Yeah. 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 But she's like, no, I'll, I'll explain the plot to you later. So she runs off. He goes back to chat with his buddy, Nick, and he's like, hey, why didn't you warn me about it? And he's like, but I did. And, and remember, you walked by and you said it wasn't important. He's like, right. Right. Shit. And a, a thing I have to point out, one thing we, we've described Michael Flatley's hat. We've described his suit. We haven't described his way of wearing shirts because I think as <laughs> this film goes on, he loses a button in each scene. Like he's playing sort of strip poker in between scenes yeah, that he, he's in every time, but like only I by a small amount. He rewards himself for every take by eating a button um, <laughs> off of whatever shirt he's wearing. And again, like you can see the body of an elderly person, right? Michael he looks fine. He keeps in shape. He's got a personal trainer. He's got all that, you know, fucking tap dancing money. But like, <laughs> I don't want to see Joe Biden in a G-string either. It's right, fucking yes. disconcerting. <laughs> and then, okay, so we cut to Eric and Vivian. They're having lunch together. And Eric is quite impressed with the view and the rates are quite reasonable too at this hotel that they're staying at. Well, there's, it's really a great place to vacation. Does he say, what a beautiful view? And she says, this place is fabulous. And I think this is Michael Flatley's, if not his actual property, then certainly he's arranged a deal with the owners of this hotel right. to get them to use this. So this feels like straight out of the brochure. Like they get to use that in an advert somewhere. Yeah. Well, and she's complaining about not wanting a black guy around all the time to <laughs> Eric Roberts. And he's like, all right, I'll, I'll have him back off a little bit. And then a henchman comes to whisper something to him that's very important. And it's, <laughs> he's so gentle and quiet with it. It's such like a delicate whisper. It made me giggle. It's not like kind of like, sir, I've got to tell you. He's like, so uh, I just want to let you know you look great today, Eric. <laughs> you, Thank you. you don't ever disappoint <laughs> me. Thank you. I know I gave you 50 bucks to say that to me every 17 minutes, but I really do. <laughs> You're doing a great job with it. Also, the moment that I've always wanted to happen in a bad guy movie actually happens here, which is that he gets the ominous whisper and the lady's like, what was that? And he's like, oh, you could, you could see the ominous whisper. <laughs> uh, nothing? Yes, Just, right, right. Um, he was making fun of you. Just telling me I don't you. disappoint anyone. <laughs> all right. Well, I know this is a random as fuck spot for a break, but in my defense, they all are. So we're just going to take one here, but we'll be back in a minute with even more Blackbird. Mm, no, that, that won't do. Hey, Marsh, what's the matter? Yeah, what you working on? Oh, hey, fellas. Yeah, I'm, I'm just searching the internet for speed walking work workouts. Speed walking? Workouts, yeah. After years of trying to keep up with Nicholas' superhuman walking speed, I'm trying to find something that can close the gap. Well, if you've got a fitness goal, a great way to get there is FitBod. What's FitBod? It's an app that's like having your own personal trainer, but way better. It's cheaper, you can work out anywhere with or without equipment, and it's easy to build a custom fitness plan that works for you. That sounds great, but have you guys actually tried it? I sure have. I love that the app provides me easy to follow videos for every single workout move, and then I can adjust my workout based on how I'm feeling, what I have to work with, and even my previous workouts. That's why I, No Illusions, personally endorse FitBod. All right, fellas, I'm sold. Uh, where do I sign up? Add FitBot to your workout essentials. Join FitBod today to get your personalized workout plan. Get 25% off your subscription or try the app for free at fitbod.me slash gam. That's F-I-T-B-O-D dot M-E slash gam. All right, Nicola, here I come. Okay, so, but like, like how fast can she really be walking? So we went to see my niece run the 100 meter dash this year at school and Nicola took first prize on her way to the loo. 
Wow. All right, I called together the secret meeting of the evil secret cabal of war criminals. I am known as the Volcano. I'm destroying villages of men, women, and children, and that is why I wear a ring. And I am the Viper. I poisoned a thousand wells and left innocence with the choice of death or thirst. My reputation tells you what they chose. That's why I wear the ring. Uh, hi everyone. I'm uh, I'm Craig. I uh, I put up the red cross flag in my dorm room. So uh, yeah, that's why I I wear the ring. Sorry, who is this guy? Oh, he is Craig. I'm Craig. No, I I heard his name. Wait, what did you do? Oh, yeah, right. So I, I spent a summer volunteering for the Red Cross in Uzbekistan. And so I put up a Red Cross in my, in my dorm room. That's not a war crime. Oh, no, technically it is. It's the misuse of an amnesty symbol. It's, it's actually pretty serious. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but like, I mean, guys, come on. Look, mate, we're, we're all war criminals here and I'm, I'm ready to get down to business. You're the one who seems like you'd rather be chatting. Hey, fine, fine. So I was thinking maybe we plant a bomb in a school. Ooh, excellent. Perhaps a dirty bomb for a touch of poison. You evil bastard, I love it. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I was thinking we could um, put up some Red Cross flags while we're there. Seriously? Well, you, you did your thing, I'm doing mine. He's right, you did. Oh, p- all right, fine. And we're back for more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the action with a little shirtless shot of flatly shaving. In case you were worried, we weren't going to get a shot of those abs. And guys, can you believe he's 65 <laughs> is what flatly <laughs> wants you to think as you watch yep. this. <laughs> yeah. How many times do you think someone had to explain to him that he wasn't allowed to script us, the audience, in the end? He's like, no, no, I guess <laughs> I went to one of them Rocky Horror Picture shows and they all yelled it out at the same time. And I just want like a, you know, woo, woo. Or a wooden be so lucky. I'll give everyone in the audience one thousand dollars. <laughs> 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 well, what's truly amazing about this is that we just see him shaving shirtlessly and hunched over so as to obviously flex his abs. <laughs> Which guy? Look, if my abs were like that, I would hunch over every time I was shirtless in front of a mirror. I get it. <laughs> and then that scene is over. Right? That was it. Mm. That was it. There was no point to that. <laughs> no. no. So, and then we cut to the concierge lady. She is calling a payphone in London to get a background check on Eric Roberts. And I guess we're to assume that this character always stays by this payphone or that she has a particular minute where she calls <laughs> for background checks. Agreed that there's a <laughs> payphone. It's like, you know how you call certain people in your family because if you don't, you've admitted that they're not your family anymore? That's what this movie does to its own beginning, right? <laughs> right. They'll just occasionally be, hey, none part of the movie. We, we remember you. We right, do. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. How's cousin Schmegging? I love that analogy, Eli, because that's why I don't call my family. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, yeah. And they haven't gotten the message and it sucks. Am I right, Mark? <laughs> but yeah, so but she's she's going to get a background check on Blake Molyneux and the guy who is one of the guys at the funeral who was talking about how Michael Flatley was the best at what he does. The guy is he's like, Well, I actually know, I've heard of Eric Roberts. He's super dangerous. He's probably doing something super evil that's gonna kill a bunch of people. We're gonna need Michael Flatley to come out of retirement and super spy this one for us. Right. And I, I don't know why. I don't know why they need him in particular. They don't say like, oh, he's the greatest assassin. No, nope. therefore we need him to kill him. That he's the greatest at like Sneaking around listening to stuff. <laughs> not, only he can sneak around listening. Like, his skill set is never defined. Nope. And why nobody else has even... Like, do they? If they're still like the MI6 kind of agency, do they have nobody on staff who can do anything approaching spy work? Like, and, oh, it has to be the 65-year-old guy. Apparently. Right, because I feel like the second best spy would still be pretty good here. It'd be fine. Yes. Yeah, it'd be absolutely... <laughs> I mean, this is quite a serious thing. I, I feel like you, you put your resources into the people you've got rather than spend all your time trying to coax like a septuagenarian or a, a well, sectogenarian out of retirement. Yes, right. Well, especially when we're eventually going to learn that this guy didn't even have the sense to put his like 
MacGuffin into the safe at the hotel. He's just got sure it in his fucking briefcase. Sure I don't not, feel no. like you need the world's number one spy for this shit. Not even a locked briefcase. No. It's, it's nope. got a lock. It Spoilers, is locked. No. not locked. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So now we're going to get this long shot of the bar, this long panning shot of the bar. Again, the cinematographer, way too good for this fucking movie. We watched the jazz singer, j- jazz lip sinker lady. This is Madeline. She walks around the bar. I fucking Michael Flatley, right? Yep. She sings at some point, and I don't know who told her about mic technique, but she she dismissed her first <laughs> right up against her jazz mark yes. in a way that I imagine would not sound nearly as pleasant as the voiceover is Mark <laughs> It's like the first year and a half of Eli podcasting. That's how much she knows about mic placement. Yeah, yeah, but if the microphone was pointed the right way. <laughs> yeah. She's got the mic pointed at the floor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, and by the way, we should point out here at this point, this is the only time we'll ever see Michael Flatley with all the buttons done on his shirt. And you can see why he never has all the buttons done. These <laughs> buttons are screaming in pain. Hardest working actors in the movie. <laughs> Hardest <laughs> working actors. And guys, has uh, has anyone, anyone ever noticed that Michael Flatley is a bit like a modern Frank Sinatra? Yes, Michael Flatley has noticed that. He's the only one to have noticed that. <laughs> yes, he's noticed that quite a bit, yes. Oh, God. And at this point, I wrote my notes. I'd love for something to happen. I'd actually pay for something to happen right now. I would buy some fireworks just to set them off in the middle of this goddamn (laughs) dance floor. But this is where he asks Vivian for a dance. And we're like, of course, we're all like, all right, well, as as terrible as this guy is, he's a good dancer at the very least. Maybe this will be a fun, exciting scene where he rips up the dance floor with Vivian. No, no, no. It's like it's like me dancing at a fucking wedding. So it's yeah. not weird. Just a weird slow dance. Yeah. They do the rock and forth. Yeah, they're just like, meh, meh, meh. he doesn't even dip her or do anything. No. You're a dancer. Yes. You're a good dancer. Ah. And it's it's not totally clear why she would dance. I mean, obviously we'll find out that they know each other, but in the in the sort of the story of this of what we've seen so far, it's not totally clear. And all I can assume is that Michael Flatley can just get any woman at the bar to dance with him because this is his island and he has prima nocta or something. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's how Eric Roberts reacts. He's like, no, no, he owns the bar. Right, You're allowed yeah. to just dance yeah. with my fiance of you and everything in it. Yeah. Yep. I'm gonna do that at QED this year. I'm just gonna walk over to random people's partners, husbands, mothers, and just be like, may I? <laughs> <laughs> slow dancing with them. I was wondering which bit you said you were going to do at QD because we have very specific policies about some of those. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, the first year I came to QED, I was a little confused about Prima Nocta and I have never <laughs> heard the end of it from Nicola. Gee. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. So, yeah, so he gets done with his dance. Eric Roberts didn't seem to care much for it, but he's too drunk at this point to do anything about it. I don't think that's a character choice, but yes, he is way too drunk (laughs) to care. So then, okay, so then Flatley and his team head over to this outdoor office so they can give him the background report on Eric Roberts. And this this is such a weird tonal shift because he's like, in the previous scene, he ends the previous scene like staring at her tits from about three centimeters away and not saying a word. And then we immediately cut to him like doing this serious business. It's like, has he's still probably got a semi on at this point as he's walking <laughs> in to discuss <laughs> the terrorists. <laughs> but this is where they point out, I love this detail so goddamn much. They point out that Eric Roberts is such a bad guy that he wears the ring that signifies the secret cabal of war criminals that are the very worst in the world. It's a secret society of war criminals. Yes. <laughs> and then this is where they explain what the MacGuffin is. And this is the best. I, w- I almost went with best worst so much shit. This is so fucking good. They're like, he's going to sell the formula that went missing in London mm. to the evil war criminals in Africa. And and Michael Flatley, of course, is he's like, what's the formula? Well, what he specifically says, Michael Flatley says, tell me more about these secret formulas. And I wrote, well, to begin with, the word is formula. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a different plural, Michael. But anyway, we'll skip over that. Uh, all formulars. right, all right, Japan. <laughs> to be fair, he says formulars. So, you know, yeah, who right, the fuck no, knows? That's true. That's true. But yeah, but they tell him that the formula, this is so fucking good. The formula 
it improves and supercharges your immune system. And I'm like, so you just walk around dripping snot and coughing all the time with a fucking heat fever. <laughs> Checks out, something. Marsh. We know we know from our years of uh, Be Reasonable, that's a great thing to do. Yep, yep, it's yep. Incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. You got to boost that immune system. <laughs> but it, it, so, so with that formula, you could live a world without pain or disease. And I'm like, I think... A world without pain would be a terrible idea. That sounds awful. Yeah, I, mean, I don't you, think I want you that. You jump on way more stages, no way. Yeah, right. a world without pain. <laughs> exactly. But, but he says, but if you alter one ingredient, it'll kill you. Is that how formulas work? Well, it is. That like, is like that's how table salt. salt works, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. like there's an extraordinary number of everyday chemicals where you just have to alter one fucking ingredient for it to kill you. You wouldn't have to buy if you because what they establish is that if you put this in the water supply, anybody who drinks it'll die. And I'm like, there's already stuff that does that. There's you don't need a secret stuff. fucking compound. <laughs> I mean, alter one ingredient and it'll kill you. That's true of bolognese. If yeah. you like switch the ground beef for uranium. For <laughs> iron shavings. Yeah, no, that'll do it every time. That'll do it every time. Do you think, because they make it seem like it gives you AIDS. And I bet there are cut lines from the script where Michael Flatley was like, oh, it's like the AIDS, is it? And they were like, you can't have you say that on camera, Michael Flatley. <laughs> Please stop saying AIDS. <laughs> So, okay, so he's learning that. And meanwhile, Eric and Vivian are having dinner and she's mad because he's not spending enough time with her. And I wrote in my notes, are those the stakes? <laughs> Currently, <laughs> yes. Also, at this point, I realize Eric Roberts is the best actor in this film. He's like yep. acting every, uh, Eric Roberts. I mean, he'll undermine that a second later in, the, in this very scene, but he's still better than everyone else in this entire film. It's it's That is not a good bar to have somehow <laughs> gone under. The Eric Roberts <laughs> bar is not one to limbo under. And I should point out, for those playing along, Eric Roberts is fucking drunk. Yep. Mm. The, like, she's like... I don't know. I thought we were going to spend time together. And he's like, how the fest? He gets all mad. She talks back. So he slaps the table. He's all mad. And there's this great moment. This is my favorite space work moment in the history of God awful movies. He's mad at her. He doesn't want to talk about this anymore. He just wants to eat his food. So he picks up his knife and fork. Like, I'm going to eat my food now. But the food that's sitting in front of him is a Caesar salad. <laughs> right, so he has to he has to roll with this, and he acts like he's going to use this knife to eat his lettuce and croutons. She storms off, and we cut back to him, and he's literally cutting up his salad with he this is little butter knife. <laughs> yep, because he's fucking committed. Also, he's drunk. Do you think does Eric Roberts do weird food stuff in every movie that he's in? Because he had the sandwich in Jingle Smell. Oh, you're right. That's yeah, true. maybe that's his thing. Like a very weird <laughs> approach to food. In which case, he's a fucking genius. Look, I've been with. Heath after 10 p.m. at night and if I was like big jar of pickles he'd be like big jar of pickles I think that's just <laughs> Eric Roberts's situation so but but we cut back to Flatley he's they've given him the background report he's like look I don't want to have anything to do with Eric Roberts and the fucking formula that's going to kill millions in Africa whatever no big deal right yeah, he's saying like, oh yeah, I don't want to be in that life anymore because that life ruined everything, which presumably is why he thinks they should just let the baddies have the kill everyone portion so the entire world dies, which wouldn't be ruining everything. That would be fine right. by, by Flappy. Right. As long as he keeps his bar. Right, yeah. And by the way, ruin everything means move to Barbados and live in this fucking fancy ass <laughs> hotel bar all the time. It must be awful. Yeah, own this Casablanca Surrounded bar. by women a third of his age who want they to want fuck to him. Fuck yes, him. right. What a nightmare yep. life he leads. <laughs> exactly. Awful. Okay, so he says no, and then we need to talk about the funniest thing that's ever happened <laughs> yes. in the entire universe. <laughs> and do. I want to be culturally sensitive here because this was such a specific moment that I was like, is this a thing that I need to know about culturally? <laughs> Because there's no way it's just, you can't, I can't live if this is just a choice an actor made. It needs to be. Which culture do you think does this? Oh, like, this, this is what I'm saying. It needs to be an Irish tradition. <laughs> Listen to me. <laughs> that when you lose an important argument, you bang your head on the table. <laughs> Otherwise, this actor has made the craziest choice ever. Because he walks out. Mm. And listener, the way that you or I might like pound our fist into our other fist or maybe slam our fist down onto the table. This actor <laughs> does mm. with his own head. He just Sorry. bounces his head off the table. <laughs> okay. 
I think I understand it. I think I understand because if you you'd bang your hand on the table if you were frustrated. But what you're not bearing in mind here, Eli, is the stakes. The actor's trying to convey the stakes. This isn't like oh, you know, you got into a, an argument about which parking space you should have used or who was late for the thing. <laughs> this is about the entire world dying. A simple hand banging on the table. That's not going to convey how bad this is. It's got to be the head. I can see his thinking. It's great. So not only does he do that, but then every other actor in the movie is like. Hey man, what the fuck was <laughs> yeah, that? They really do. And he's like, I gotta go. That hurt a lot. You, that actor is like, oh, why did I head? There's play? no way that was in the script, right? That's <laughs> it's not in so the script, fun. and that's why no everyone reacts that way. It was like, shot. whoa, man, what did you just do? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here's what actually fucking happened. I watched this scene like 11 fucking times because it's the funniest thing <laughs> in the world. He just storms off and this guy headbutts the table and you're like, what? And so I kept going back. I think what happened is that he slammed both hands on the table, but he moved his head down as he did it and he moved <laughs> out of frame. Oh, so it looks like he just wow. had butted the table. But Honestly, he actually just slapped no, his I'm head. so relieved. I'm so <laughs> relieved. I, I was just like, this is not, I don't know what's, I can't move forward in a world yeah. where when this guy's <laughs> kid comes home with a B minus, everyone has to put pillows around. Yeah, e Eli, you, you've you saved Eli a lot of problems at the Dublin live show that you'll never yeah. do in the future. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, flatly, he's having a drink, drowning his sorrows, remembering the good times with his fiance. This is where I wrote, this is the gaudiest room I've ever seen that didn't have Donald Trump in it. And then it's oh, him and his fiance, they're having dinner in the dining room, but it's the world's biggest table. But they're perched really awkwardly on the very, very end. Like this was like, I know this was shot in his house, but it feels like maybe like the real estate agent was coming around to take some shots for the sale later. And he's like, well, don't mess up the whole table because I'm going to have to clean the whole table <laughs> before right. we do the, the sale. Just this corner is fine. And that way we don't need to, you, you won't muss up the varnish or anything. And I know this is hard to say after the scene we just fucking did, but this might be the funniest fucking scene in the movie because this is where Madeline, the jazz singer, comes in, right? She's wearing this robe. She drops her robe. She's got a G-string on underneath it. She, like, looks back at him coquettishly like, yes, I desperately want to fuck you, Grandpa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does she say at this point, Noah? Oh, God, does she say anything? I don't think she says anything, no, does she? No one says anything in this whole <laughs> fucking scene. It is astonishing. She just walks in silently, drops her robe, stands there in her knickers and her high heels, looks over her shoulder, and nobody says a fucking word until she's back at the door. It is wild to me. Right, he just put, he puts her fucking robe on and sends her away, and I'm like, maybe that's because you're 61 years older than her? Is that why? <laughs> yeah, is that what it is, buddy? Is that what it is? Also, I love that this actress was like, no, I'm not showing my boobs for this movie. And he was like, what about... Side boob and shadow. And she was like, you're fine. <laughs> like, this is, this is a, like, contractually obligated side boob, if ever oh, I've yeah. seen oh, one. Uh, absolutely. But I also, I wonder whether there's an element of they didn't know what rating the film was going to have to get by the end. It's like, okay, well, don't, right. don't, don't have her tits out because then I, I Michael Flatley, won't want to have to cut her tits back out of the film. Like, once they're there, <laughs> they're in for good. So, right. you know, he can't trust himself with that. He walks her out like... You ever feed a neighborhood cat and then the <laughs> owners put a collar on it that's mm. like, don't feed me because the cat's getting fat because it's your fault. That's how he walks around. He's like, I'm sorry, <laughs> I but I know I've been I've been putting out a can of whiskeys, but you you have a name. <laughs> Yeah, so he sends her away. He has another flashback. This is where we see the like the bad guys lighting his fiance up like a medieval lady with an opinion, right? Don't worry, yeah. it will get funnier. It will. It is, yeah. it is already that funny and it will only get funnier. He's also wearing the world's tightest leather jacket. Like it is way too tight <laughs> as he's walking in the woods. Yeah, it's a child's gap. And then he wakes up at the end of his flashback. And I think he wakes up like shocked because he's like, <gasps> why did nobody tell me how tight that jacket was? I got, I got. <laughs> like, when you see a photo of yourself from 10 years ago, he goes, oh, I can't believe I wore that. What were right, my friends right. doing? Could they not have said something? He's like, is that a thing? <laughs> not at all, Marsh. Can't relate to that at all. <laughs> Morgan, cut that. Yeah. Yeah, you were like, remember that time you used to wear like respectable clothing? What were my friends letting me do <laughs> yes, here? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So the next day we see that, that Vivian is mad at Eric. She's giving him the silent treatment, right? 
Nick still hasn't given up on trying to get Michael Flatley to prevent the war crimes, but Michael Flatley's given up that life, damn it. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about his hat in the in this scene? As he's like, he's moving bottles. Because he's a regular Joe who mucks yes. in. He's not one of those kind of bosses. He's moving the bottles. He's moving crates of bottles like from his left to his right. Everyone else is carrying them in like quite a distance. Yeah. <laughs> but he is wearing an incredibly low cut shirt, like open all the way, and a flat cap. And it is an adorable flat cap. It oh, is Oh my lovely. gosh. It's like, you ever seen that thing on YouTube? I forget what they're called, but there's a school that does like really nice musicals with kindergartners. It's like their production of Guys and Dolls. There you go, yeah. <laughs> Size and everything. Like he just took the costumes direct. Well, yeah. And then, and this is of course where the concierge comes out and swaps out his bottle moving hat for his driving hat for mm -hmm. him. Yeah. Right. Yep. He goes to leave and Nick says, hey, you know what? 10 years ago, you wouldn't have just let this formula fall into the wrong hands. And Flatley's like, well, that was before the time jump, wasn't it? We cut ahead, if you recall. He's like, yeah. yeah. He's like, God damn it. Don't make me explain my backstory in front of the staff. <laughs> yeah, At right. least wait for a, a private doodly do. <laughs> and again, I was of the, I'm really happy to learn this wasn't the case, but I was now of the belief that the character Nick Bad butts things when he's upset <laughs> and they're talking in front of a fountain. And I was like, is he gonna, No, this is dangerous. Is he going to headbutt that fucking fountain? <laughs> Do people need to pick where they give Nick bad news? Right. Like, <laughs> you know, I do want to talk to you, but not here in the middle of this apple orchard. Can we? <laughs> oh, Michael, I'm, I'm interested. In the uh, in the yard there, you've uh, you've hired a bouncy castle, like an inflatable bouncy castle. What? Nick, um, can we, can we Nick, meet in the we bouncy need to castle? Talk. <laughs> we need to talk. I need you to sit down, but then I need you to sort of like sway up and down slightly yeah. as I move like, a, like an ocean-y kind of display. Oh, this isn't good. My wife just said she wants to meet me at Mattress Barn. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so Nick storms off. He's all very upset. Michael Flatley gets in his car and just then Vivian jumps into the passenger seat and she's like, drive, because she wants to escape from Quan, right? So they drive off. We see Quan, he has to like dingy his way out to the big boat to tell <laughs> Eric Roberts that Vivian escaped. And Eric Roberts is like, it doesn't matter. Nothing in this movie has consequences. So mm -hmm. you're fine. Okay. What's happening right now on this boat, guys? Mm. So they, they've gone to the sea mm -hmm. to do a bank transfer by <laughs> internet. I think. That yes. He's hacking? He's having to hack the fucking he's got a South African hacker. the South African hacker's accent is incredible I love a South African accent on a bad white guy he's like I can't do it with all the time precious oh, yes. it's, it's lovely I absolutely love it <laughs> they also but they brought champagne and mm -hmm. boat babes yes and uh, can, can I say heavy air quotes on the boat babes these people were like yeah no if you rent the boat we will stand on it but only if you don't leave the dock and Michael Flatley was like sold boat babes yeah right right I feel like they were working at the boat yeah, like the place where rich people buy boats and they were the, the sort of the thing to lure people into the boat and Michael Flatley was like I'll take the boat and the girls for an hour <laughs> yeah. like, alright fine yes right yeah. right so yeah, so so they're on the boat. He's talking to his hacker, his South African hacker guy, and he's giving him like more generic bad guy talk. But so the hacker has to hack harder, right? Because he's threatening him. He's like, you know, if you don't hack hacky enough, then I'm gonna hack you up. And so the hacker types really fast. And can we just can we just let the listeners be fully aware of Eric Roberts' other motivational technique when it comes to your hacker banker? If they're not working fast enough, what you need to do is just straddle them from behind and like slowly dry hump them, and that will really speed up. And in fairness, if I was that close to Eric Roberts, I would suddenly become an incredibly good hacker. Yeah, I, I yes, was gonna right, say, right. I'd somehow channel it somehow. Yeah, I could play concert piano. <laughs> if the alternative was being dry humped by Eric Roberts. <laughs> So the hacker's like, yeah, so we got out, we did the hacking. And he's like, okay, so transfer this money for me. And he's like, oh, I can't do that because we don't have money in that account yet. And Eric Roberts is like, oh, all right, well, throw him off the boat. And so he has a henchman throw the hacker off the boat. They're not like, they're not moving at the time, right? Let's just, just be. And they're not far. No, like this they're guy like could really just like close. swim back to the boat and go like, well, now my shoes are wet. You asshole. Yes. And he continues to participate in the conversation. He's like, oh, come on now, guys. <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh. yeah. And what I love about it is that's just a very lighthearted prank. Then one of the other people in the boat's like, hey, you can't do a lighthearted prank like that. And Quan breaks his neck. And then he breaks his neck. <laughs> 
so the boat babes are just witnesses to murder him? Yes. Do we have to snap their necks? <laughs> and over such a low stakes, he just like pushed the guy off into not that deep waters. Yes. Well, that is something worth breaking someone's neck to cover up. <laughs> no one accuses Eric Roberts of breaking the pool rules because that would be disappointing someone. And I never disappoint right. anybody ever. <laughs> In fairness, it is pool rules because he's also just heavy petted him as he was hacking. So yeah, like, he's true, broken yeah. two of the pool rules. There. Right. At this point, he needed a stern talking to. Yeah. So, okay. So then we cut to Flatley and Vivian walking on the beach discussing her backstory. We are halfway through this movie, 45 minutes into this movie at this point. Literally nothing has happened. I wrote in my notes at this point, I will suck this movie's dick if that will make a thing happen, but it won't. <laughs> oh, see, I was loving this. I was loving this the way that like, you ever see someone get up and waste too much of their time of their best man speech on a bit? And then they have like, <laughs> Four, they realize they have four seconds left to be nice because they were too busy doing like an impersonation of a seagull or whatever. <laughs> That's what this movie does. The movie blew its wad on Michael Flatley in his tiny little baby outfit. And now they were like, shit, shit, guys, we have 36 minutes to finish a movie. Well, right. It is, but it's it's literally the opposite of that because I think all the, the fundamental scenes that are actually like of anything actually happening in this movie, and we haven't really had many of them just yet, those were the ones that they filmed in 2018 when they said the movie was finished, but it wasn't. Right. And then when they were shipping it around to like, can we get someone to actually do the rest of it? And no one did. They're like, fuck, we've got to fill the rest of this movie. And that's what we've covered so far is just like, whoo, just Michael Flatley like twiddling his thumbs yeah. and people like whistling down with their hands in their pockets. That's what we've been uh, experiencing. Yeah. So, okay. But then they explain their backstory. She was uh, still a spy with the agency and was tasked with keeping an eye on Eric Roberts and fell in love with him. Now they're now she's going to marry him, right? And Vivian turns to him and she's like, so that's my backstory. What's your backstory? And he's like, it's weird that you would ask because you know this already. But yeah, I will also tell you my backstory, right? <laughs> yeah. But this is where we learn that he and Fire Girl were secretly engaged. He kept it a secret because he didn't want any of his secret spy shit to come back on her. But it did. But but then he brought her on a mission? <laughs> no, it's uh, en entirely unclear. Oh, was she kidnapped, maybe? No fucking idea. It was bring your fiancé to spycraft day, and I, re I really shouldn't have <laughs> taken it as seriously. <laughs> and when we see flashbacks, the mission does just look like a paintball game that got out of hand. That's what <laughs> right. I feel the mission was. <laughs> And the lines that they say to each other are so bad that it's hard for me to believe it wasn't bad on purpose. These are the actual lines these two people say. He says, I'll never forgive myself for that. And she says, you can't go on living without love. So <laughs> and then he says in the bright shining morning sun, it's getting late. It's like 2.30. <laughs> it is. We can see the sun. Yes. It definitely is at late. We watched the characters eat breakfast. We know the timeline. Right. Unless she marched angrily around that hotel for six to eight hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like, how far from the hotel did they drive? Like, yeah, Barbados right, right. isn't that big. <laughs> have like circumnavigated the island. <laughs> <laughs> he took her on like the tour and okay this is where the, you can see dolphins actually sometimes yes. this, uh, <laughs> sometimes the, not all the time but occasionally you get dolphins on it <laughs> so then he he drives her back to the hotel now it is late right they get back to the hotel <laughs> like he heard us yes. he heard the joke he wrote in our notes he was like it's fucking late see it's late it's night <laughs> or, it's, or it's like he could only afford to hire the sun for so long it's like yeah the boat <laughs> the girls and the sun they've got to go back to the shop within the hours yeah. so we have to be pretty quick about this <laughs> sorry I spent all our sun money on side boob but it's okay it's okay we'll get it to work out so okay so she goes back in he goes his way she goes her way Nick catches her as she goes back into the hotel and we have this great exchange where he He's like, your fiance is a war criminal. And she's like, no, he's not. And they just scream this in this crowded hotel lobby. <laughs> yeah, she didn't. She couldn't talk before because she didn't want to give anything away to Nick. But now it's fine to have like a very loud yelly argument in the middle of the bar. It's yeah, it's amazing. About what a fucking war criminal her boyfriend yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> Nick says the sentence, you have to get out. And the amount of syllables that this actor manages to work into the word 
out. It's beyond accent. It's beyond culture. It's a tone poem. He's a, you have to get a, <laughs> yeah. His Irish accent is more offensive than yours at this point, Eli. Yes, He's absolutely. like putting you to shame. No question. <laughs> yes. Also, like, the reason Nick and, and Michael Flatley know her is because she was also a spy. So she was a spy assigned to spy on the bad guy and was like, well, this guy's story checks out. I'm going to marry him. Yes. That was the story we're meant to believe here. She's a shit spy. Oh, God. Nick says, this is probably the worst line in the movie and I love it so goddamn much. I want to embroider it on a fucking pillow. Nick says, you were with the agency, Viv. We used to stop the bad guys, not marry them. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like a very specific training you would have had to go through. <laughs> That was the agency's motto. And you know what? I never thought it would come in useful. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> if only you'd learned Latin, Viv. <laughs> so yeah, so she storms off. A lot of people storm in this movie. I've never used storm as a verb more often in my fucking life. She storms off, flatly storms on. And he's like, Nick, how dare you get onto her for marrying a fucking war criminal? Get out of here. And he's like, didn't I wander off in a rage in the last scene? And she's like, yeah, actually, now that you mention it, you did. What are you doing back here? Uh, you guys took nine hours to drive around all of Barbados. I... <laughs> I got snacky and came back. I had to take a shit. Yeah, I forgot my hat. I came back to the hat. <laughs> so Viv goes back to her hotel room. Eric Roberts has left the fucking prom dress out for her, right? <laughs> to change into. So she changes into it. Then she goes to a secret briefcase, right? And this is where she finds the MacGuffin, the hollow coin, which is like a fucking SD card or something. Right. In what world can we describe this as a secret briefcase? In that he's left it out on the bed, unlocked <laughs> right, with war yes. crimes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it might as well be a box labeled war crime. Right? Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's a little less secure than Kanye West's passcode. Yes. <laughs> Quick reminder, Kanye West's passcode is zero 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 zero. Uh, amazing. <laughs> So, all right, so she gets, but she gets the MacGuffin and she starts walking around looking at it like, oh, this is very clearly a bad guy SD card. And just then Eric Roberts comes in and she has to act like nothing's up. So she sits there and we do that moment. And this is in every spy movie, right? Where the girl knows, but she can't let on that she knows yet, you know? Right. So he comes in behind her. He's wearing a fucking, a robe with green glowy grid over black that would look out of place without vector graphic spaceships flying across it <laughs> the whole fucking time. And, and I will say, usually these scenes are sort of characterized by suspense and ominous nature. This is more of a, is Eric Roberts going to throw up on this woman <laughs> kind of suspense? It, it's, it's throw up or sexually harass. Those are the two yeah. options. And he, he could waver either way. Yeah. yeah. And right. you can really see her hoping for throw up in, in her eyes as she tries to get out of this scene. Yeah. She looks so upset by Eric Roberts touching her and that just isn't acting. That's why it looks so convincing. Yeah, no, she is not acting. Yeah. Yet. Right, yes. So he goes to take a shower. She's like, oh, I'm going to go get some water. And he says, have room service send it up. I'm like, have him send up fucking water, you overprivileged fucks. Jesus. Hello? <laughs> One sink, please. <laughs> so Although is... Is Barbados one of the places you can't drink the tap water? Probably. I realize yeah, this probably. is a weird ped pedantry point, but it might be that. And this is this. That's, it's fine. As a social justice proponent, I would never assume that you couldn't drink the water anywhere I go, Marsh. I drink <laughs> sink water everywhere. Because <laughs> I believe in equality. You're like equal opportunities for parasites and dead <laughs> Exactly. Right. Also, right. I've already always got diarrhea anyway, so <laughs> why would I? You are the reason other people can't drink the water. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> you being introduced to the sewage system of the <laughs> island is why everyone has to stop drinking the water. If you're not going to let me poop in your water tower, don't have a tour. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I say that to every city equally. <laughs> Looking at you, Orlando. <laughs> Check out the live show. Got all the movies live. So, okay. So, but she uses this excuse to run off, right? She's like, I got to go get some water. She hauls ass. So she runs, she finds Madeline, the jazz singer, and she's like, hey, where is Michael Flatley? But but Madeline is too jealous to tell her. Actually, no, she's not. She she says she makes like she's not going to tell him. And then she then she tells her. Right. And she's just admiring herself in a mirror because the she women is. in this film have no inner life other than admiring their appearance or having other people admire their appearance. Yep. That's the only thing they're there for. Yeah. Sorry, I was just finding out who the fairest of them all was. What <laughs> 
<laughs> so then we get uh, we get Eric Roberts. He comes out of his shower and he realizes there was water in that hotel the whole time. She must be lying. <laughs> Look, my fiance slow danced with a man I've never met last night, and then they got into a car and drove up for apparently eight to twelve hours a row alone by themselves <laughs> on the island. But water when there's already water in the room, something is afoot. All right. I think right. So yes, yeah, so, but she finds Michael Flatley standing, like looking pensively from his private balcony, and she like she starts telling him like you know oh you know you were right he's a bad guy and I have the MacGuffin and everything. Michael Flatley will deliver his lines. He's talking to his like long lost love who's visibly distraught. He's delivering these lines like he's reading back her order at the drive through. <laughs> right? He's like he doesn't know that acting is supposed to have emotions in it. You know when someone catches you on your way to the bathroom and you don't want to be like, sorry, I have to shake a big old shit right now. So you try to do a quick version of the conversation. That's how Michael Flatley acts in this scene. Sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah, mini discs are as mini discs do. You know what I'm saying? Oh, oh man, Vindaloo curry, right? Like, why, would I, why would I choose a curry right now? <laughs> so... Yeah, so but she shows Victor the memory card and she's like, this is the MacGuffin. And he says, that holds the formula that could kill millions of people. But and, and then, of course, the thing to do then would be destroy it, right? <laughs> yes. Just to you know, get it wet, put a magnet there, set it aflame or something, whatever. But she, at this point, she's like, you know, I can't believe I was such a fool to get involved with him. I need you to take this formula and get rid of it. And he's like, oh, I don't want to get involved. <laughs> And this is incredible to me. He still doesn't want to get involved. We are two thirds of the way through his vanity project where he's a yes! super secret spy and he still hasn't done anything. And when presented with an opportunity to do something, he's like, no, it feels nah, too active. I, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. I just want to stick out. You know, I've got to be honest. I've been wearing tap shoes the entire film. They've had to edit them all out, but I, and I don't want to ruin them by crushing a mini disc. So... <laughs> so yeah, and then, I, and I, I'm sorry for just to repeatedly reading this movie's script to you, but it's so bad. You have to hear it to believe that it's really this bad. He says, Vivian, I have no strength left to fight. And she says, Victor, you have strength left in you. I feel it. You're the only one who can stop this. You are 25 years of standing ovations, Michael Flatley. Don't <laughs> you tell me. Oh, Jesus Christ. But anyone with a strong magnet, as you say, could stop this. Anybody could, like, <laughs> yeah. she could stop this. She could just d destroy the mini disc, and it's done right now. Just yes. squeak. Just close your hand hard, and the mm -hmm. whole movie is over. Yeah. So, but then Madeline, the jazz singer, sees them, and he sees her, sees uh, Michael Flatley kiss her, and she jealously harumps away and tells Eric Roberts on them. <laughs> <laughs> And I do like that the stakes going on here is that the woman a third of Michael Flatley's age is jealous that the woman a half of Michael Flatley's age gets to kiss him and she doesn't. That's, yes. that, that's the math that we're working out there. Right. And so they go to the even older uh, Eric Roberts and he grabs his henchies to go get Michael Flatley once and for all. And I guess a, a less savvy viewer could believe something was about to happen. So we're going to take advantage of that misapprehension long enough to take a quick break. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Will more nearly naked women of a third of his age throw themselves at Michael Flatley? Will every scene from this point on be dumber than the last one? Will we ever find out what it is that the Blackbird was supposed to be good at? No, yes, and sort of, which should be plenty to keep you here for the action-inferred conclusion of... Blackbird. Action inferred is amazing. Thank you. I was really <laughs> proud. I was really proud of that That's one. That's incredible. <laughs> so this is the file. Yes, sir. You'll have it in twenty-four hours. Perfect. Show the man out. Yes, sir. And Mr. Bankson. Yes. Don't disappoint me. Okay. I wasn't planning to. Good. Uh, sorry. Yes, Mr. Bankson. It's just uh, it's just like a crazy shitty way to end a meeting. I'm so, I'm sorry. Well, you, you should be. What does that even mean? Don't disappoint me. Well, it's a it's like a threat. I'm threatening oh, you. Oh, you no, know, I picked up that it's a threat, but we're we're terrorists, right? I get that I'm going to get murdered if I mess up. It's just you're creating 
What's the, you're like creating a hostile uh, work environment? Hostile work environment. Thank you, Jerry. Seriously, Buddy, Ollie, ahead. you too. <sighs> Honestly, I've been I've been wanting to talk to you about this myself, boss. Guys, we are evil war crime terrorists. Right, but I'm just saying we could be evil war crime terrorists, not in a hostile work environment. Exactly. Um, have you read Who Moved My Cheese? I'm gonna kill both of you. Yeah, we've heard. Yeah, hasn't read Who Moved My Cheese. Hasn't read Who Moved My Cheese. <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit we're going to rejoin the action with flatly on the beach turning that memory card over in his hand thinking about where the plot should go from here right it's like okay so I've, I've got the deadly formula there's no reason why i wouldn't just squish this right now there's no possible i mean i'm the movie isn't over it's the only possible reason You're right. i wouldn't yeah. squish i'm right this. here on the beach i could just skim this into the ocean yep. and we're done <laughs> Yep, sure the fuck could. But Matiti comes by. He goes, Matiti, I need you to make a copy of this for me. And I'm like, why? Oh, it's great. He's like, yeah, I need you to make a copy of this. You know what to do. And it's like, yeah, it starts with going back to 2002 and buying a mini disc player and then getting one of those cables <laughs> attached to another one. <laughs> so meanwhile, so Vivian gets back to her hotel room only to find Eric Roberts waiting and knowing that you know, his evil MacGuffin is missing. And I'm like, well, obviously he would know that, right? She knows that he came to sell that to like war criminals or whatever. So it's worth millions of dollars. So like, obviously, why would she go back to the room yeah. at this point? Can I talk about the timeline of this scene as well? Because in a previous scene, he goes in the shower. She goes downstairs to have a conversation with Michael Flatley. She then comes back up to this room. In the meantime, Eric Roberts is downstairs at the bar talking to somebody and finding out that she's talking to Michael Flatley. Right. And then gets back to this room. How short was his shower? And was his shower a teleporter to the bar? Or has he <laughs> just forgot that he was meant to be taking a shower and that's why she got out of the room? It's just, it's inexplicable. Or did she once again, did she like walk all the way around? Did she circumnavigate Barbados <laughs> on her way back up to the room? Yeah, that's none possible. of this shit makes sense. She couldn't remember if you turned left out of the bar or right out of the bar to get to the room. She turned left, she walked around the entire island. Around Barbados. <laughs> Right. And she did that thing where it's like, oh, I could turn back, but I can't remember how much further it is. And at this point, it might right. be longer to turn back. So I, I'll yeah. just gamble. I yeah. think we're all right. I'll gamble. I'll carry on. <laughs> or maybe Eric Roberts had one of those confusing hotel showers and you don't want to call the front desk. So you're just like, it's fine. I'm on vacation. I don't need to shower. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So he tries to do this like menacing line, but of course it's Michael flatly writing the script. So it's just this just random. Do you think I'm a bad man? Kind of nonsense that it goes on for yeah. three or four minutes. Am I a bad man or am I just, which is like, it's what like a, an English Google translator would say of a good <laughs> line in a movie. <laughs> so, yeah, he's like, I'm just trying to make room for newer, better people. And I'm like, that Nazi. So you're a Nazi and you're not trying real hard to hide it. Which is weird because Michael Flatley disagrees with him. And I don't know where we are here. Well, yeah. so I think that that's Michael Flatley trying to be like, you know, he's like, well, you know, all the best villains are villains that you can sympathize with. So what if this one's a <laughs> Nazi eugenicist? Yeah. <laughs> the immigrants are coming to take our jobs. <laughs> but now Eric Roberts has to go meet Ahmed for dinner. And this is going to be really really awkward, right? Because he's supposed to give Ahmed the disc, which he doesn't have, and he has told Ahmed in no uncertain terms that he never disappoints anyone ever. <laughs> anyone ever. So he goes to the he goes to the dinner and there's this great exchange where he goes, where's the money? And Ahmed goes, well, I thought and Eric Roberts cuts him off and goes, oh, you thought? Well, then the deal's off. I'm keeping my makeup, <laughs> which I totally have. You don't know. I have it. I have it right here. Look, I'm Hand closed, and I'll just wave it, and then I'll put it's it right back here, in my and then pocket. I'm just back there in my pocket is. now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Don't insult me again, sir. But he tells Ahmed, he's like, "I'm not going to give it to you. Your boss has to come get it now. We'll go one bad guy up the chain of command." And Ahmed's like, "Well, fine," and he storms off. And I like at this point, Quan comes over and like checks in because he's like, oh, you know that the boss is like really serious. And I just love that they've got a relationship where he can like check in on his boss and like, how you doing? Is everything all right? Yeah, how, right. How, it's not like a, a, a like a judgmenty kind of thing of like a big power structure. They're, they're pretty chill in their Eric Roberts organization. Right. They're like no, a family nice at that terrorist organization. <laughs> yes, <no. laughs> And then we cut just... Now, this is a scene that I would normally leave out of the review. We cut to Nick drunkenly stumbling around the town, you know, thinking about the backstory. Apparently he was there as well when Michael Flatley's 
fiance got killed. Oh yeah, he, he trips and falls into Michael Michael Flatley's flashback. Yeah. So, oh no, I <laughs> fall into the flashback. <laughs> right, yeah. So he wanders around in the flashback for a minute and normally I would leave that out. But what that scene normally would be doing in a movie is establishing why Nick won't be there later. But Nick will be there Nick later. Nick will be it's there later. Just he just stupid. <laughs> I think that Nick was just really drunk and really had a cameraman with him. And he was like, why are you filming me? And he was like, I don't know, man. I just. <laughs> this can't be less interesting than the rest of this. Michael film. said we're getting reimbursed. <laughs> Either that or he's not drunk. He's just suffering from severe concussion from that time he headbutted the table. He headbutted the table. Thank you, Marge. And that's why the cameraman is to follow around. They have to make sure that there's somebody watching him at all times. Don't let him go to sleep. It's all right, but just don't let him go to sleep. Not for a little while. We'll, we'll, we'll monitor him. It's fine. So then we get that we have to finally get the moment where Eric Roberts and Michael Flatley meet, right? So Flatley's walking through the... Uh, the bar and Eric Roberts stops him and he says, I believe you have my MacGuffin. Oh, I love this so much because Eric Roberts stops him by going, Victor Blackley. And flatly turns around and goes, I'm Victor Blackley. It's like, yeah, he, that's why he said the name. He wasn't like calling it out like it's uh, <laughs> like, it, like there's a taxi for Victor Blackley. In the <laughs> Victor Blackley, anyone Victor Blackley? He was addressing you. I've actually just been saying random combinations of names. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first person to turn around. Steve Greenish. Is there a Steve Greenish here? No. I'm getting an M. Um, mm. <laughs> so good. And again, it's just James Bond through the lens of an idiot, right? Yes. He has this great moment. Where he's like, because they're going to do the Casino Royale thing. And he's like, are you a gambling man? And Michael Flatley says, that depends on what you mean. Yeah, it's like, well, I mean, like games of chance where you put some money down to the opportunity to win more money. I don't uh, know how to define it any better. I, th I thought you were asking if I was a giant stack of poker chips that had filled out a human skin suit and gotten really popular <laughs> as a tap dancer in the early 90s and late 80s. But no, I'm not that thing. I'm what you no, said. I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, but Eric Roberts challenges him to poker, right? So we're going to watch him play Texas Hold'em. And we're all very excited because this is the closest anything has come to happening in this entire movie, <laughs> right? <laughs> and every, I'm so sad Heath isn't here because everything about this poker is hilariously wrong. Yes. The guy who is the dealer will later be a player. Yep. <laughs> when they're introducing the game, they announce that aces are high in Texas Hold'em. <laughs> As opposed to what? And multiple cards is better than not having any that match. <laughs> also, they've got so many chips, but there's only two of them. You don't yes, need like Why would there be three chips? million dollars? So, like you're building a fort out of chips. And like, <laughs> so, Michael Flatley's hiding within it. There's so many chips, and they're different shapes. Like he's got the he's got rectangle ones in the action shots, but the circle ones are the set dressing. It's the best. Oh, oh I forgot my favorite part. Sorry. So they're both holding their cards like your grandma playing fucking Go Fish. Right, like they're playing Uno. Yeah. Both of them. Ugh. Eric Roberts is like waving his around and Michael <laughs> Flatley's holding one on each side of his glasses. It's the best. <laughs> Eric Roberts says you can you can tell a lot from about a man from how he plays poker while simultaneously bending the cards in his hand. It's like, <laughs> yes. yeah, Eric, we fucking can. We really fucking can. I do see that. You yeah. motherfuckers don't know how to play poker is what I've learned. Yeah. And and the whole time, like, they're trying to Hannibal Lecter each other, right? Like, Eric Roberts is like, I can tell by how hard you press your cards together that you're a forceful man and all this dumb fucking shit. That goes on for so goddamn long. Oh, there's a line Eric Roberts says about Michael Flatley. He was like, well, you clearly want to be seen as intelligent, which would denote a rather narcissistic personality. And I said, yeah, yeah they do say, write what you know, Michael Flatley. <laughs> <laughs> he's got it. You're getting it, baby. And I love the third guy at the table because, yeah, he's the dealer at times and sometimes the player. And I love it when he's a player because I just want him to be like, just cut him like rolling his eyes as the two like twice yes, either side right. of him keep engaging in this like banter and badinage. And he's like, just fucking play a card. He just <laughs> keeps calling cards off the table. They just keep having to fall cards off. The they're, they're literally, he's literally <laughs> holding the cards up to his eyes right now and saying, I'm an alien bug. I'm an alien bug. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> There's this moment where like uh, he sees Eric's bet and then he, after putting his chips in, he says raise, but then he doesn't raise. It's so mm. wrong. It's so stupid. And at one point, the blind is 2,000. They've all put 2,000 in. And then he raises 40,000, which like, that's way more than it's in the pot. They wouldn't let you do that. Come on. <laughs> I raise you 8 billion dollars. No, you don't. You can't do that. 
Yeah, so but they're bantering this entire time. At one point, Eric Roberts says, you're nothing but a washed up, failed secret agent masquerading as a hotel owner. And I'm like, well, he owns a real hotel. I mean, that is a... <laughs> you guys are sitting in the... And, and the poor fucking soundtrack, it's just doing its best to add gravitas to this fucking... 12 year olds rendering of a James Bond pre-action sequence. And my favorite thing about this bit, because we'll come back to the game. I didn't know we'd come back to the game. My favorite thing is like, Eric Roberts puts a bet in and Michael Flatley folds. And like, then we cut away. And it's like, we haven't even seen the front of a single car. No. <laughs> <his morning. laughs> Fold. Well played, my friend. Oh, yeah. nope. <laughs> Just normal played. <laughs> So we check on Matiti and the concierge. They're like looking for Vivian now. So Matiti sneaks into Vivian's room, but Quan gets the drop on him, right? So we see that. We cut back to the poker table because we're not just going to get him folding. He he wins eventually too. <laughs> There's this great stupid fucking moment where they go to show their cards and he's got three queens. Michael Flatley does. And the audience, and there is an audience, everyone in the hotel is now gathered around to watch these two men play Texas Hold'em. The audience gasps at three, three queens. queens. <laughs> There's like a one in 200 chance, or one in like 100 yeah. chance or something you might have that. It's like everyone has that if you play that for long enough. It's not that interesting. Yeah. Are those playing cards? Rebel, 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 rebel. <laughs> Is that Michael Flatley? But Eric Roberts has a flush at that moment, so he ends up mm. winning. Right. And then and then he's like, also, didn't your fiance get burned up in your backstory? Didn't that happen? Got him. Too? Yes, Got him. How can you feel so good about cards when your fiance is dead? Ooh, sick burn. <laughs> sick burn. <laughs> yeah. Sick burn is what she died of, actually. Yeah. She died from a sick burn. <laughs> but Flatley's got a more tricks up his sleeve. He hasn't tried the old having better cards trick. So he uses that on the last hand. He goes all in and he wins. <laughs> and it's so stupid because they both go all in and the lady's like, show your cards. And Eric Roberts shows his cards and he's like, I have a monologue. And the poker lady's like, of course, you're allowed to do your monologue before you turn your cards. Go <laughs> yes. Also, slow roll your cards one at a time because nobody <laughs> around the table is going to be bothered by you putting your cards down one at a time. Yeah. yeah and right. then poker is over. Poker's over. The end poker. <laughs> you're just allowed to leave. Yep. He won at the poker. And then just then the concierge lady comes and she's like, hey, I need you for a scene in the next room. And he's like, oh, is it going to be an action scene? She's like, none of them are going to be action scenes, man. Calm the fuck down. Okay. <laughs> hey, we get one. We get half an action scene. It's I, think, I have half an action scene. Uh, we get one thirteenth of an action scene. So, <laughs> so, but they got to go check on uh, Matiti. Matiti has been shot. Matiti is dead in a little circle on the ground. Like, like clearly they angled it. They, they like they waited for him to get to the right spot to shoot him to make this work, right? Right. Or they shot him and then dragged him into an antechamber to be like, "This is dramatic. Let's put him here." <laughs> right. Like a ritual thing. Like, oh yeah, he's got to die in the middle of the circle, otherwise the death. It doesn't won't count. We don't get points yeah. if he dies out here. Yeah. <laughs> so you're right. So, but Matiti has the two memory cards. So right, like so. Flatley's like, you are my great friend, but honestly, I really just need these two memory cards okay, for your Now corpse. I have two of these cards and I don't know what to do with them. Right, right. Why did they kill him if not for the memory cards? Yeah. Because like, they went to that room looking for the memory cards. A guy walks into that room. They killed him. They didn't go like, do you want to just like raffle his pockets a bit in case there's anything in there that is like the memory cards we're looking for? Because if they do that, right. film over, the apocalypse wins. <laughs> yeah. So we, we cut to the bar. Victor and the concierge chick, they're drinking to the memory of Matiti. Madeline sure is sorry. She walks up and she's like, I'm so sorry that I told the uh, bad guys where you were. And then they came and killed Matiti. And he's like, no, I, I knew you were the rat. I forgive I you understand. now. Mm. Matiti was the most killable of my former comrades who is now my butler. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's like, look, there's only two black guys in the film. At least one of them had to die. We'll we'll take bets on whether the other guy will survive. Oh, yeah. here he comes right now. Yes. Here he yes. comes <laughs> to die. <laughs> So Quan comes in and he yells, Blackbird! And we're like, oh, fuck yeah, Blackbird. If you don't think the five of us cheered loudly in the cinema when he went, Blackbird! Oh, fuck <laughs> You do not know us. I cheered in my living room. <laughs> right? I called Eli and cheered on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's time for Michael Flatley to kick a little ass. Yes, we will get to finally see the fight choreography of the film. It is, and you might want to write all this down, Right, left, right. Yep, mm -hmm. right, left, right. But 
Here's the thing, Michael Flatley, you, this is your movie. You get to win the fight however you want. <laughs> Why did Michael Flatley choose, and then I punch him a bunch while he's down? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I punch him to death while he's prone on the floor. <laughs> it's not yes. like, oh, I, I, I got him with such a big shot, uh, like a big uppercut that I've like killed him and I didn't mean to kill him. It's like, no, he's down and now I will beat him to a Now I'll park. kill him. I'll <laughs> beat him to death on the ground. Yeah, right. And they, they like, one of the guys walks up, Nick walks up and like checks for a pulse and he's like, no, nah, that guy's, He's dead, no. actually, and he's like, "You bet your ass, he's you punched him so good." And seriously, no dancing. I was so <laughs> ready for a dance. Let's be clear. Let's be honest. Let's be radically vulnerable. If they had had a dance fight just now, this is <laughs> the best movie ever made. Can I give you this, Eli? Mm-hmm. He punches him. He's down on the floor, but instead of punching him to death, he does dances the dip and dance yes. on his head. Yeah. 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 Come on, tap for 10. It was right there. Could have been so much better. Tap for yeah. the 10 count. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, sir. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but Quan is dead because of how very hard Victor punches. And then we get, he goes, like, flatly goes out to the pier to look out over the sunset and ruminate about his dead fiance more. Yeah. This is where he tries to give it a good cry. He tries, he goes for his Oscar here. But like, we flash back through different things he's seen. We flash back to the fiance. That makes sense. He flash back through a few other things. We flash back to Maddie the singer in her little thong. Yes. Which is like, that wasn't a pivotal part of his oh, life. Yes. It's just like you want to get your money's worth for that shot, my right. flat. <laughs> no, no, I remember that side boob. It was important. It was as important <laughs> as when they lit my fiance on fire. Right. Yes. <laughs> So yes, but he wakes up on the beach. Apparently, he killed a man in his own bar that he owns. Then he walked off and passed out on a beach 15 feet away. I guess that's just like, you know, white man in a predominantly black country privilege, right? (laughs) So I guess that does make sense. So, but then, okay. Then he, once again, he justifies his inclusion in god-awful movies. He storms off to the church to confess his sins after all. Mm -hmm. And he says, and I quote, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, and I'm about to sin again. And I wrote in my notes, he wrote this whole movie around that line, and then Marsh wrote, uh, like, right next to that in my notes, literally, yes. <laughs> so, because <Yeah, 'cause laughs> this was absolutely one of the fil- one of the scenes that he filmed when he didn't have a full film. Be like, ah, you see what this could be like? And then when no one could see what that would be like, he had to do the rest of the film <laughs> You're himself. Right. You're right. <laughs> Oh God, that's so amazing! <laughs> so yeah, so so he fly, we, he's going to confess his sins. He's going to tell us the full story of Fire Fiance, and here's the big part that he's been holding back. <laughs> the guy's doustering gasoline set her on fire. She he showed up while she was already on fire, and he had to shoot her and put her out of her misery. Right, right. and that's what he's been carrying in, in in his heart ever since. Right. She was on vultures of horror levels of fire, by the oh, way. In case yes. anyone was yeah. worried about it being too gruesome, no. She's on like a fucking SFX package you get on Humble Bundle level of fire. Yeah, she's three and a half feet away from a fire that we're also looking through. Yeah, you know? exactly. She the, she was in, in real risk of dying from being just behind that fire layer in the CGI. Yeah, so what, right. if that, what if the fire breaks out of the layer and comes into, into the one that I'm in? Yeah. yeah. Also, let me just throw this out there because I don't think enough people say it. If someone is on fire and you shoot them, that's a good thing. You yes. did a nice thing. Well, and that's what the fucking stupid ass, like, because then we cut to him, like, running out of the confessional and the priest comes out and is like, well, obviously you would do that, though. Like, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, that's just totally so, so fine. Yeah, 100%. Normal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, that was the big confessional moment. Then we Madeline runs into the church and she's like, they've kidnapped Vivian and apparently I know that for some reason. <laughs> they want you to meet them like at the big boat graveyard where the big action finale happens. And he's like, oh, the action finale. Well, I must... Well, I the, must. the big finale. Let's not go big action finale <laughs> until we right, see Right, well, yeah, yeah, no, fair. So, so he goes down to the old boat graveyard for I can't say dramatic, I can't say action packed. <laughs> the, the end of the movie, Eric, Ahmed, and Farouk are there waiting for Flatley. Now, who is Farouk? You might say he was the guy that was beating that dude to death in the jungle orphanage for no fucking reason an hour and eighteen <laughs> minutes ago, and that we've never seen or heard from again. Right. <laughs> 
So they're standing out there. They've got a bunch of henchies out there. I, I wrote my notes here. I'm like, do the henchmen have uniforms or do they have to coordinate? Right? Or do they? Yeah. I'm not sure. Guys, we're doing black on black today. We already decided. <laughs> I, I think it's if that they buy specific clothes, they get to like claim that back against the company. Whereas if they sure. buy something deviating from that, they don't get to do that. Right. So that like, explains the it's one not a guy. Uniform, in the... But it's de facto. Yeah. yeah it's exactly. like those Aaron sweater <laughs> door straps where they're like, no, you can get the sales tax back on the way back. <laughs> So yeah, but so Flatley shows up. He's wearing his like white jacketed tuxedo with a tie off and everything. Because again, he's just like Frank Sinatra if you think about it. But like the only reason he's dressed like that is because he always dresses like that. Because like when you see this shot in the trailer, like, oh, this is exciting. No, that's just like his regular wear. Yeah. So it's just not impressive. That's just what he wears to the swimming pool. Yeah, right. it's kind of lost its uh, power. So yeah, but the henchmen carry him away for a beating. Right. They're like, he, he comes in mm. and he's like, I'm here for Vivian. And they're like, where's the thing? And he's like, I'll give it to you when you give me Vivian. And the henchmen like walk him around behind one of the boats to beat him up. Yes. And let's just pause here and remember, we watched this in the cinema. We had no idea what was coming. We are there in a dark cinema. It's all very serious. They've walked around the corner and this is the climax of the film. And now, Noah, let the listeners know what happened. <laughs> We hear punchy sounds off screen. Literally, we watch them take him away. The camera stays still on the take away area and we hear <laughs> pew, pew, pew. like the sounds <laughs> that you would expect to hear out of a dust cloud with fists and feet popping yes. out of it. <laughs> right. We hear that. Then we hear four gunshots. Eric Roberts is like, ah, they got him. And then he walks out. So the big fight scene happens off the camera. <laughs> it's off screen. We've watched an hour and a half to get here of Michael Flatley not doing anything. And when he does something, it's not in the film. It's no. on the film. <laughs> Just keep, think about this. We watch Michael Flatley change hats four <laughs> times more often <laughs> than we watch him fight a person in oh. this spy thriller. <laughs> It's so fucking good. He walks around. He's all beat up now, but but the bad guys are even more beat up, I guess. And he's cleaning his hands on like a rag or a towel. Yes. Did he bring the towel? Did he, he like, towel, oh no, what yeah. I'm going to do I'm is I'm going to like need... beat them up off screen and I'm going to need to wipe my hands. Bad so I don't want like mussy hands. Yeah. yeah. So then, so they, they release Vivian, right? He comes around, they release Vivian. She runs up to him. He's got to fight all the bad guys now. And he says... Probably the worst line ever written in this or any other language. He uh, says, I disagree. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> you tell me what line is worse than this. Quote, look, we're probably never going to see each other again in this lifetime, but I want you to know that it was you who gave me the strength and courage to come and face this today. I'll take that with me. <laughs> Oh, no, that was a bad line. I thought you were talking about the way he ends this scene, which is the greatest line ever written by man or God. So, yeah. No, <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, all right. So, I got retract a good one my criticism. No to. Right. Okay. That is a terrible That's line. The stupidest goddamn thing I've ever heard in my fucking life. <laughs> yep, sure is. <laughs> so, and then Nick shows up out of fucking nowhere. Nick shows up and he's like, I will fight alongside you. And they're like, Yeah. I was wandering around with a camera guy, headbutting a fountain. <laughs> How did Nick know to get there? Because he was like lying drunk in a flashback somewhere. So he didn't know this was happening. And even if he went somewhere and and like the jazz lady was like, oh yeah, go down the docks and stuff. The bad guys didn't secure the perimeter anyway. You could just like walk right. into their top secret meeting about the formula that will kill the entire planet. So, yeah, it's fine. There's, it's Barbados. Who, who could wander? There's not that many people here. Who could really wander into this anyway? And then we have this bizarre fucking moment where Farouk walks up to... Michael Flatley and he's like look I don't want to be part of the big action finale here can you just give me the MacGuffin and I'll leave and Michael Flatley's like oh yeah yeah no you can have the MacGuffin he's like here you go I was like all right are you sure this isn't a fake MacGuffin he's like no it's not a fake this is a totally totally real MacGuffin why don't you uh, wander off yeah it, it's it's super important that I survive for the inevitable sequel so like I'm gonna walk out of here yeah. and I'll see you in like a film or two's time yeah yeah <laughs> right right <laughs> and so he wanders off and now we've got Eric Roberts and all his henchmen on one side and we've got Michael Flatley and Nick on the other, and they've all got guns. And we're like, oh, are we going to have a great big shootout to end this movie? Are we going to get one action sequence at least right here at the very end? Are they at least going to dive behind a, a pile of something and pecu-pecu at each other? No. Mm -mm. 
Nope. They're all going to just pull their fucking guns out and all shoot at each other at once. And all the bad guys are going to miss and the good guys are going to hit and the movie will be over four (laughs) seconds later. But not before (laughs) Michael Flatley says, shall we dance? Oh, you're right. Yes, yes. I laughed so loud. Anna came upstairs and was like, hey, you got shot? What happened? I was like, sorry. (laughs) Michael Flatley made a movie and then decided that the peak conclusion of it would be him being like, "Uh," he honestly might have been like 25 years of standing ovations and it would have been as funny as what they did. (laughs) But yeah, they ate eight-year-olds playing cops and robbers. Unathletic eight-year-olds playing cops and robbers it. There's not even a dive roll. Yeah, it's pew, pew, pew. I definitely got you. You died. I got (laughs) you. I got you. You did die. You did die. Yes. They all just stand at point blank range and they shoot each other. All the bad guys fall down. We get this all from a fucking overhead shot too, which is amazing. All the bad guys fall down. That is the end of the action finale of this goddamn spy movie. It's so good. Let's hear Mac the Knife again, everybody. Yes, one (laughs) more time. One more time with the lip sync. So we go back to the bar to wrap things up. They use the same fucking song. I mean, they don't even yeah, give us a new song. Again. <laughs> right, because I think this actress sang this song, maybe not live. I think she's lip syncing. I think it's her voice, though. And I think she had it in her contract that she gets two full singing scenes for every standing around in her underwear scene. <laughs> I think that's what this is. <laughs> so, yeah. So then, so we, we pan around. Nick has a new beautiful woman hanging all over him. We haven't met her yet. There's just a new one. And then we get the bad guys. They're checking the formula. And wouldn't you know it, it's fake. And they're very angry. And then we go back to London, right? Where good guy lady that we've, I guess she was in the fucking funeral scene, right? And we haven't seen her since. I don't know whether she also like randomly turned up to the Barbados hotel as one of the characters or whether it's a totally different lady. I think it's a different lady. The women have got, they're all the same age, similar appearance, and no distinguishing characteristics because they're not developed as characters because Michael Flatley doesn't see women as rounded human beings. Right. So it's just like, yeah, there's like a dark-haired lady and like there's another dark-haired lady who may be the same lady. I don't care. It doesn't matter. They're not important. <laughs> they've, got, right. they've got boobs. They're sometimes in heels. That's all that you need to know about them. Yeah. There you go. And then we check back in on Flatley's mansion. He's wearing another <laughs> jauntily tilted hat, right? And this is when like Vivian shows up at his house unexpectedly and she brought a suitcase and it's lovely when women do that when they show up at your place with a suitcase and they haven't told you they're coming. No, you can auction it off at the same time as your house. It's very useful. <laughs> Maybe she didn't bring the suitcase. Maybe she came to collect Maybe she bought it. Right. Yeah. She bought it in the auction. Could have been. <laughs> All right. Well, clearly he's making us wait for the sequel for the big river dance fight. But hey, I'll tell you what. We're fucking here for it, Michael. We are <laughs> I fucking... am teased. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's going to do it for our review of Blackbird, but that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to loop back around and do this again next week. So Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, we'll once again be jumping into the cinematic universe of the Wright family, oh. makers of such excellent films as The Bible, The Badge, and Bigfoot. But this is a true story. No, it's not. We'll be watching... The Exorcism in Armorillo. Oh my God, you give me Blackbird this week and the right family next week? I'm so spoiled. This has been such a good year. We're pulling up the stops this year, baby. 2024, it's our year. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 440 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Michael Marshall for helping us out this week. Be sure to check the show notes for links to his other shows if you'd like more Marsh in your life. And a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an every version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing A, The Citation, D&D Minus, and The Skyward Guard, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email God-awful movies at gmail.com. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song is written and performed by Ryan Slotnick and People Drafts on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and why she was for permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Neil Bostic, I'm No Illusions. Promise to work harder, earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. Michael Flatley went on to win a Nobel Prize in Physics for his pioneering work in hat angular jauntiness. <laughs> well, it's actually, it was a Nobel Prize. It's one that he started himself. <laughs> Madeline went on to regain her dignity doing some porn or something. 
Blackbird 2 took place entirely off camera. However, the Irish government is still paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go down a delightful rabbit hole of the things that are technically <laughs> war crimes for this uh, sketch. Yeah, well, you picked a good one. That's great. You say rabbit hole, you mean white bulge. <laughs> <laughs> Excessive celebration is one. Excessive celebration of war. After a war. Like, oh, you can't do okay. a big, like, we got. Yeah, it's em. not after a touchdown. You can <laughs> really do whatever you want, really, there. And it's never, it, there's no point where that <laughs> elevates to war crime. <laughs> It was just like the, the Hague's football team got really yeah. pissy one year. <laughs> Look, we're Ado Denard. <laughs> we, lost, we lost the Dutch Cup. <laughs> you guys were real you jerks just... about it. <laughs> <laughs> just like the Nazis. <laughs> yes. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.